this uh, our recording is in progress. Our research symposium together. Um, I did want to also just uh, give a great, great amount of thanks and a shout out to our Sea Grant team. You can hear see uh, see them on the side here, Laura, Melissa, and Tanya as well, who will be um, here to help also support with some of the technology. And we'll go over some of that in just a minute. I think we can move to our next slide here. Um, as you all can see, we're in more of a webinar format today. So the chat is open. Feel free to ping us um, as the hosts and panelists. You can also um, use the Q&A function to ask questions as we go through our presentations together today. So um, please feel free to just ask any questions that you might have um, regarding the technology. I know many of you are familiar with Zoom at this point, but just some instructions for anyone in attendance. You can open that webinar chat on the side and that will allow you to send messages to the hosts, the panelists and attendees. Um, you can also use the raise hand function on the bottom right if you have a question and would like to speak out loud. Um, and in, then you can also question and answer um, on the Q&A function on the bottom. So that will allow you to ask questions to the hosts and the panelists. And we can either reply back to you um, via text in the Q and A, or you can answer. Um, we can answer your question live if, if we have the time. So that's how we'll be managing kind of um, uh, questions from from folks as we go through the day together. Please let us know if you have any questions on that technology. We're also trying to include a little bit of engagement. Um, we're we're really excited. We have over, I think, as of last night, over 150 registrants with us. So. Um, really dynamic group in attendance today. But one way that we hope to kind of just have a little bit of engagement is through Mentimeter. And for those of you who have not um, used Mentimeter before, it's uh, a, a web-based and also cell phone-based technology. So you can go to menti.com and use the code there on the top, 36662732, and answer questions that we will have posted along the way. Starting here with what organization or community are you representing here today? So um, this will be a great way for folks to engage. I see um, some contributions coming in here. State Parks, Scripps, California Sea Grant, Tijuana Estuary. Awesome. This will this will stay up as um, as we give a little bit of an overview of the webinar today and also a bit on um, a land acknowledgement that we wanted to share with you all. So thanks for that, Melissa. And again, menti.com, and you can see the code uh, in the chat, and you can share uh, share your answers with us this way. So um, just to start, I, I would like to respectfully acknowledge that we are working in the unceded ancestral lands of the Kumeyaay, and we recognize that they and other tribes who should be part of this conversation are not well represented here. Um, with that said, I hope we can see this as an invitation to do better to reach out and do meaningful engagement so that the future stewardship of our coastal estuaries is both advised and guided by traditional and Western knowledge, values, and perspectives. So the um, overview for today is that, um, and just a little bit of background, in 2019, the Tijuana River National Estuarine Research Reserve hosted the Tijuana Estuary Symposium, and it was, it was in person at that time. And we've opened uh, this research symposium to a much wider audience, thanks to our, our technology. Again, we have about 150 participants who registered as of last night. And so we're excited to see you all here with us today. Um, many of, of you who either work or research um, these systems, uh, we know that estuaries provide valuable living labs for advancing wetland science and, and, and really trying to understand how wetlands respond to stressors and also understand some of the management actions that we may take to reduce some of these stressors. We know that they're, they serve as innovation labs for assessing restoration efforts and tracking contaminants to continue improving their health and their resilience so they can serve as vital habitat and recreational areas for the public. So our basic idea really was to connect 
a lot of these projects with managers of the systems where these projects are occurring. So today we'll be focusing on um, the Tijuana Estuary, Los Penasquitos, and some in San Diego Bay. But we recognize that um, this work represents a much broader opportunity to share some information at this point. So this will just be a slice of the activities that are going on in our region. And in the future, we would love to think about collectively with you all about ways to open this format and format uh, forum up to other projects that are happening um, in other systems in San Diego in the San Diego region. So we're very excited to be here together today. I think at this point, I would love to open up um, our first our first ses session and segment here. Um, but before I do that, I did want to just also acknowledge that we um, have not built any breaks into this webinar format. So just encourage you throughout the course of the day to just um, do what you need to do to take good care of yourself, get up and stretch, get a coffee break. Um, this will be recorded so um, you, you, you can feel uh, confident that you won't miss anything if you want to take a moment to just make sure you get some movement um, throughout our day together. So with that, um, I think I will hand it off to um, Adam Young with the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. Our first session is Coastal Processes and Estuaries and the Dynamic Connections to Beaches in the Ocean. And we'll be going, um, at Adam. after following Adam, we will be going into an, uh, our next presentation by Alex Simpson, also with the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. So um, I will hand it off to Adam. Hi everyone, um, let me know if you can't hear me, but I'll start. Um, so I'm gonna talk about um, the Scripps Coastal Mapping Program and some of the applications and the research that we're doing and touch a little bit about how um, some of this is related to the estuaries in San Diego County. So uh, these are some of our traditional mapping tools. Um, we have uh, ATVs, jet skis, and a dolly that all have high-grade GPS survey equipment that are used to survey beach sand levels. And so these instruments collect data directly um, underneath of the instruments. So typically these are collected along transects along our coastline. Um, so this is an example of, of what those data sets look like. So um, we collect cross shore transects um, out into the surf um, typically to about 10 meters water depth, and then um, again, it's about every 100 meters along shore. Um, some of our newer survey tools, we have um, various LIDAR systems that we have on drones, as well as this truck here on the bottom left. This is one of our primary survey vehicles. This is a mobile LIDAR mapping system. And then we also have um, drones that take high resolution photos that we can also um, generate three-dimensional models with. These are a lot different than the GPS-based tools. So if you haven't seen one of these three-dimensional models, this is a this is just an example of a LIDAR point cloud at, at Torrey Pines. Just to give you an example of some of the detail that we're now able to map out the coast with. So this is, um, you see these people on the beach, this is a relatively crowded day at Torrey Pines. Now, right now, the data is colored by elevation, but at the same time, again, we're also taking high resolution photographs that we can drape on top of those three dimensional models that provide a whole nother layer of information that we're able to study the coastline with. And one of the main things we do with these, with these models is um, we can track the, the changes on our coastline over time. So one of the nice thing about these new tools is that we are um, we're able to map out all these different features in the coastal zone. So previously with those GPS tools, those are some of our, again, our older survey equipment, which we still use, um, but they typically were just able to monitor the beach sand levels. But with these new tools, we're able to map out all these different features in the coastal zone um, that all interact and allow us to understand how the coastline is behaving better. Uh, so we have two primary survey areas in San Diego. Um, one of them is in Southern San Diego County. Um, we started the surveys in this area in 2008, and these uh, started in the Imperial Beach area and slowly increased over time, spatially to the north. Um, and currently we're surveying monthly in this area from around the Tijuana River mouth up to Coronado. Um, 
our other primary survey area is in Northern San Diego County. Um, these surveys started back in 2001. So we have a really nice data set here in Torrey Pines. Um, and these surveys also have expanded spatially over time. Um, so we're currently surveying two to three times a year from um, La Jolla Shores all the way up to Oceanside. And then we survey weekly from Torrey Pines up through Encinitas. So we cover a lot of the lagoons and estuaries in, in Northern San Diego County with these surveys. So in addition to those regularly scheduled surveys, we also do rapid response surveys. For example, um, I'm sure a lot of people are aware, we have a very large wave event here uh, last month. Um, and, and so we went out and surveyed uh, right after this event to, to document the response of our coastline to, to this and other similar extreme events. Um, so what happened here, um, these are some pictures from North County where a lot of the sand was completely stripped off our beaches, leaving behind um, just bedrock and cobble. Um, and in other areas, the, the dunes retreated quite a bit. So we had a really significant event here just, just relatively recently. Um, we also conduct uh, rapid response surveys when we have um, uh, large landslides on our coastline. These are just a couple of examples we've had over the last couple of years in Blacks and Scripps area. And you probably heard um, we had a large landslide in Blacks relatively recently. And that, that was our most recent rapid response survey that we conducted for a landslide. So if we put all that together, we have compiled a, a very large database throughout San Diego County of, of our coastal conditions. So on the vertical axis here is um, a longshore location so Mexican borders down at the, at the bottom with San Onofre State Park at the top. The horizontal axis is time. And each one of these bars, colored bars is essentially one of our surveys that we've conducted. Um, and the colors represent beach width. So a blue is a wide beach and a red is a narrow beach. So what we have here is a very detailed data set of how our coast has been evolving over time, this is one of the most detailed data sets that exists for, for a regional data set. Um, and one of the things that's nice is we not only can look at the regional picture of how our beaches are behaving, but also can look at individual beaches and see um, you know, seasonal patterns. You can see alternating blue and green in some areas, and that's a seasonal pattern where we have um, summer accretion and winter erosion. You can also see some beaches are just typically wider than others pretty much throughout the year, others are just are, are red and they're very narrow. Um, but one of the interesting things here is, is you'll see these very thin bands of sort of anomalies um, in, in the region. And these typically are the same locations that we that the river mouse come out. So the, the river mouse and the estuary mouse behave oftentimes different than our beaches. And this is an example. Um, this is in Cardiff and uh, where the living shoreline is. Um, on the right-hand side of this photograph is the San Lijo Lagoon. Um, so this is the change that's occurred on our beaches just this last winter associated with that large storm event. So you can see pretty much the entire beach has eroded except for just around the river mouth. There's actually accretion over this time period. So we can see opposite effects and behaviors of the areas that are impacted um, where the estuary and lagoon mouse come out. Uh, some of the other things that we monitor with um, this project are if we have nourishment that happens and just briefly go over a, a paper that was recently published by Bonnie Ludka and some others at Scripps about the 2012 nourishment that was, that was placed in, in, in Imperial Beach. Um, if we look at, at this figure here, this is um, the conditions of what was happening before the nourishment was placed. So, uh, areas in pink are areas that were eroding and areas in green were areas that were accreting. So we have um, in this location B an erosional hotspot here. This is where the sand was placed, this, this black uh, bar here. And then we also have um, an accretionary area down here by the Tijuana estuary. Um, and this is before the sand was placed and then what happened afterwards. So the sand was placed here, a lot of the material eroded and actually move south down and accreted down in this particular area down near the estuary. Um, 
if we look at what the estuary mouth was doing over this time period, so from 2007 to 2020, um, the, the river mouth actually migrated about 600 meters south. So on the top here, you can see it moving southward. And in 2016, it actually closed. This is a relatively rare event. I believe the one before this hadn't occurred since 1984. Um, and again, so the nourishment was placed in, in 2012. And so this, this plot here is showing the southward migration of the river mouth. And the bottom plot here is showing um, the accretion potential driven by waves. And so you see a lot of accretion potential during the El Nino events, which are these, these gray bars. And so in 2015-16, we had a very large um, El Nino event. Um, so increase the erosion potential in this particular area. In combination, a lot of the sand from the nourishment had piled up down just north of the river mouth. And these conditions combined are what likely caused this river mouth to close in 2016. And that caused all kinds of problems for different kinds of creatures living inside the estuary. Uh, some of the other things that we map on our coastline with these tools are, are the bedrock on our coastline. This is important to map out because this is sort of the bottom boundary of how far our beaches can erode. And this sort of information is not included in, in current um, models of beach erosion. So we're trying to understand this better, where this feature is located. Um, and also, if we know this boundary, then we can also quantify how much mobile sediment we have within our coastal system. Um, we also use the data to map out cliff erosion along our coastline. This is sort of my, my specialty, but I won't have time to talk about this today. Um, but the last thing I want to talk about is, is the cobble on our beaches. So if you've been to the beach recently, you've probably seen a lot of cobble. Uh, this example here is Torrey Pine State Beach. On the left is um, in November, um, and it was completely sandy. And then just a month later, it transitions to almost 100% cobble. And so cobble is not very well studied along our coastline compared to, to other sandy features. So we're starting to really try to um, understand how the cobble is, is um, interacting with our beaches and the other coastal features on our coastline. Um, the cobble is interesting. One of the things that happens during a storm event is, well, sand moves offshore, but cobble actually will move onshore. Um, and so they have an opposite behavior. And this photograph here on the left is a, a cobble berm that's formed in, in um, southern Carlsbad. There's a very large cobble berm that's actually providing some natural shoreline stability. Um, and, and there are several nature-based projects now that are, are trying to mimic these types of features and are using cobble to try to, to provide shoreline stability. For example, on the right-hand side here is a cross-section of the living shoreline in, in Cardiff, where they did have a component of this, um, of this project did include cobble at the toe of, of the living shoreline. Um, so unfortunately, cobble doesn't always stay where you want it to. Um, on the left-hand side here is the access way in Torrey Pines. This is the, the pathway that goes underneath the bridge at Los Penasquitas Lagoon, where a cobble berm has moved up on to the access way blocking it here. Um, and this actually happened um, just very recently as well. Um, on the right-hand side here, uh, waves can you know, mobilize cobble and actually throw it into structures causing damage as documented here um, in Oceanside in 1980. Um, the other thing cobbles can do is they can move into the lagoon mouth and cause impacts and probably influence um, times when the lagoons are actually closed. This is a photograph taken by Darren Smith just very recently of, of Los Panasquias Lagoon. And you can see the huge amount of cobble that has moved up into the, into the lagoon mouth here. That's causing it to, to restrict a little bit. Um, so we wanna understand how cobble is um, impacting our coastline. We're, we're mapping it out. And one of the things we're doing is using that LIDAR data to, to map out where it's located. So Hiro Matsumoto has developed some machine learning tools that can map out um, the large cobble patches as well as small um, patches of cobble along our shoreline. And so we're using that to apply it regionally throughout the data sets in North County and can quantify how much cobble we have on the surface. And on the bottom right-hand plot here 
is an example of that of those data for a two kilometer stretch. Um, and you can see in, in the red line in November, we had very little cobble in this particular section. You can see a transition to high amounts of cobble up to about 60% of cobble covering our beaches. So we're tracking the cobble along the beaches on the surface to see how it interacts with our beach. Um, now this particular project, uh, that the cobble mapping only maps cobbles that are on the surface of our beaches. But we have another project happening where we've inserted um, small RFID tags inside of about 400 cobbles and release them at Torrey Pines Beach. And we can go out and map them monthly to, to see where they're going. And that's what uh, this ATV has a, a, an antenna array that it tows behind. And when this drives over top of them, then we can detect where they are. So I'll show you a little video of um, essentially what they've been doing. So all these on the left-hand side here are the cobbled positions. On the right-hand side is the associated wave height and time. So we released the cobbles in, in two different time periods. So um, the red here is, a, is the first deployment that we did. And you can see the, the patterns are very complex. You can see sometimes cobbles are moving both on and offshore at the same time. Um, one of the interesting things is that they don't tend to stay in the center of the beach. They like to go uh, down toward the shoreline or else migrate towards, towards the back of the beach. Um, we did have a significant wave event um, about two years ago, and we did uh, a lot of the cobble migrated south at this time or else moved to the back of the beach. Um, and in the summertime, what we have is the, is the sand coming back in now and has covered up a lot of the cobbles. Um, so one of the, the things that we're, we've learned from this project is that um, the movement is very complex. So they're going in different directions at different times. Uh, they don't tend to hang out in the middle of the beach. Where we released them actually had an impact of where they ended up as well as um, where they moved. And the cobbles that were able to migrate to the back of the beach um, and form these cobble berms were relatively stable once they got there. And in order for these cobble berms to be stable, um, it really mattered if there was space in the back of the beach um, to accommodate this movement. So these cobble berms, when they form, want to move onshore. And so if there's nowhere for them to, to move to, then, then they, they're not very stable. And this has implications for the lagoon and estuary mouse because that is a location uh, where it's open and these types of features can migrate um, into the back shore. Uh, so in summary, I talked a little bit about the Scripps Coastal Mapping Program, some of the tools that we have in our database, some of the research that's going on associated with this um, database that we've been collecting, and how the beaches and cobbles and estuaries are, are, are interacting along our coastline. And I think uh, we're doing questions later from my understanding. Yep, thanks, Adam, so much. We'll be um, holding questions until the end of the segment. And next, we'll be hearing from Alex Simpson um, on a presentation, Mouth Morphodynamics and Impacts in inter Intermittently Closed Estuaries. Hi, thank you. I'm happy to be here. Screen sharing. All right, good morning. Um, my name is Alex. I am a postdoc working with Sarah Giddings on her NSF-funded wave plume interaction study at Los Penasquitos. In addition to the recent dive study, which I'm sure you're all aware of, and which Sarah will be talking about in her presentation, um, I've been spending some time investigating the morphodynamics or morphologic change at the map of Los Pen. And I want to mention I'm sort of riding on the shoulders of giants as I continue this work of Madeline Harvey and Sarah, um, as well as I'm presenting on behalf of a, a number of graduate students in our lab. Um, and of course, I want to mention I'm uh, presenting work from funding sources, uh, state parks, you know, uh, Sea Grant, and significant support from the National Estuary Research Reserve. So Los Penasquitos, as everyone here knows, is a low inflow intermittently closed estuary, which means it's an estuary that is not permanently open to the ocean. These types of estuaries exist worldwide. Um, they're commonly found in Mediterranean climates, um, as shown in this global distribution figure from McSweeney et al. Um, they're specifically characterized by having rapid morphologic change, specifically at the mouth. And many of the estuaries exist throughout Southern California. You can see in this figure by Doty. These types of systems provide 
crucial wetland habitat and coastal resiliency for flooding, but they are under threat from sea level rise. So on this figure by Doty, you can see um, the wetland habitat loss under a 1.7 meter sea level rise. I'm going to start out the talk by quickly walking through some snapshots from the mouth of Los Penasquitos. These are super recent. They're just from the past month. Um, they're daily snapshots uh, taken at lower low water, which is measured offshore, or close to lower low water when that happened overnight. Um, and they're showing a daily change from January 20th through February 3rd of this year. Um, I want to note uh, as I flip through these images that the arrows are going to stay stationary. So we're starting with um, this arrow pointing to the center of the channel on January 20th, um, and this arrow uh, pointing to the top of the berm on January 20th. So here's January 21st, and keep your eyes on those arrows and what's happening underneath them. There's a 22nd, the 23rd, there's the 24th, 25th, 26th, 27th, 28th, 29th, 30th, 31st, February 1st, and February 2nd, and February 3rd. So you can see over the past 14 days, this mouth has migrated and narrowed, and a couple berm has accreted. So here's a schematic showing the various sources of sediment accretion and erosion at the estuary mouth. Uh, the red shows processes that accrete and the blue shows processes that erode. For accretion, uh, littoral and onshore transport um, and incoming flood tides provide sources of sediment at the mouth. And for erosion, uh, ebb tides and river discharge bring sediment out of the estuary. The figure on the right, the movie, is showing a cross section through the mouth of the estuary in the along channel direction. You can see that the bar or sill cuts off the estuary at lower low water relative to the offshore. We can see this in a time series representation below the video where the sill is the brown line. When the accretion exceeds the erosion, the bar can build high enough to entirely close the estuary off from the adjacent ocean. So you can see in the time series that there are times when the bar is higher than the ocean water level. When the lagoon mouth closes, the estuary can experience consequences such as hypoxia, uh, breeding grounds for mosquitoes, um, and often prompts emergency maintenance dredging. Um, I will note that for some Northern California estuaries, closure is an important ecological process, providing uh, ecosystem habitat for fishes. Um, however, most of the Southern California estuaries have been experiencing more frequent and extended closures relative to historical conditions. Which is just showing the, uh, the mosquitoes. Mm -hmm. uh, so in this work, the, the field site that we're focusing on is Los Penasquitos. Um, this is a map of the area showing our various sensors, which I'll get into more detail on later. Um, but we are also doing work at the Tijuana and Pajaro estuaries and have looked at other estuaries throughout Southern California. So let's dive in here. This is a pretty dense figure, um, but I'm going to point out some key features. This is a figure from Madeline Harvey's work, Harvey et al. 2023. Um, these plots are tidal phase averages, which means they cover over four and a half years of data or over 1,000 tidal cycles. Working from top to bottom in this figure, um, the top shows water levels offshore and in the estuary. Uh, then we see density, then we see a dissolved oxygen, then we see a wave energy, which is split uh, into wave period. Um, then we see water velocity where the red is the flow going into the lagoon or flood tide. Um, and then we see a turbidity. So during open conditions, which I'm showing here, um, the estuary behaves much like a larger estuary with higher freshwater inflow. Next, I'm going to show the week preceding estuary closures. So this is averages from the weeks preceding estuary closure over this time, the four and a half year time period. Um, this is what we call pre-closure. In this week, waves, particularly in the infragravity band, enter the estuary during flood tide and bring in sediment. 
Um, the color bar kind of hides it a bit, but the IG waves are 2.3 times bigger during pre-closure relative to the open period. Um, there's also sediment transport um, during these large inflow and wave periods. And the last panel I'll show you is during uh, now the periods when the estuary is closed. During this time, the estuary starts to slowly freshen. Uh, the flow stagnates. Um, and this leads to hypoxia at depth um, as the stratification overcomes turbulent mixing. So bottom waters are depleted of oxygen and unable to be replenished. Um, the overall freshening and stagnation creates these breeding grounds for mosquitoes with vector-borne diseases. Um, and it also can provide a stressor for marsh plants. Um, the estuary also fills with fresh water, which can lead to, can lead to a flooding concern. So we know that there is hypoxia and freshening, um, but can we measure the direct biological response? So this is a project um, that our group is working on funded by the NOAA Coastal Hypoxia Research Program, which allows us to look further at historical patterns of closure and biological impacts. I'm only briefly touching on this, um, but Lisa Levin will expand upon these impacts for benthic species, and Luke Miller will expand upon the biosensors and a follow-up in a collaborative grant later today. Uh, but basically, we put collocated oysters outfitted with sensors on them to measure their gait uh, with high resolution dissolved oxygen and hydrodynamic processes. So the full time series that we've measured uh, shows that oysters respond to freshwater signals during which time they close. The two figures I'm showing here are phase averaged by time, uh, time of day on the left and salinity on the right. Um, and show the fraction of the day that the oysters are open. So oysters exhibit a 24 hour signal where they feed most of midday, which co-occurs with dissolved oxygen and pH signal, possibly due to a daily production or respiration cycle. Um, we had our biosensor mooring deployed before an estuary closure, and then it remained in place throughout the closure. Uh, this was in 2020, which was particularly interesting because it immediately followed um, a massive offshore red tide. So algae was trapped inside the estuary leading to rapid oxygen decline. And our preliminary results show that the oysters are responding, responding heavily to freshwater signals. This is work that's, that's being worked on by our graduate student, Neem Andijar. So I've described sort of step-by-step step what happens when the estuary closes, has a big impact on the ecosystem and human risk with vector-borne diseases and flooding. Um, so now, what are the mechanisms that lead to these closures? Where is sediment coming from? And can we better predict when the closures will happen? So we're doing work funded through California State Parks um, that where we're investigating high resolution mouth and adjacent beach morphology in tandem with in situ hydrodynamics. So we're measuring waves, water level, salinity, and velocity inside the estuary in the surf zone and offshore. Uh, we know from Harvey et al. that the lower low water level is a good indication of sill height at LPL. So here you can see it in uh, the sill height in green. And we know that closures occur when the sill is 1.2 meters to have to aviate. We've also seen over extended periods of time that closures at low spend are more frequent and last longer when there are large waves and low river flow. So big waves, low river. Um, during 2015, uh, El Nino, we saw this uh, specifically. And this is consistent with work that's done by Dane, Behrens, and Mara Reskinen. Um, this work surrounding the sill height metric is currently being expanded on by our graduate student, Lauren Kim. Um, as we just heard from Adam, um, it's interesting looking not just at Los Penn, but at several estuaries up and down the Southern California coastline. Um, Adam's group found that the estuaries tend to accrete at the same time that the adjacent beaches erode. So this begs the question of understanding the morphodynamics in more depth. Where is the sediment coming from? So sand and like this year, as you heard, cobble. Um, is it coming from offshore or is it coming from the adjacent beaches? So this is what we are currently looking at. Just to revisit this slide, um, I want to point out two uh, key um, pieces of, of information that we are sensing here. So we have a footprint of a drone um, shown in black, as well as a footprint of a LIDAR. So I started this work by using quarterly drone surveys. Um, these have been conducted from 2017 to present under state parks funding. The drone surveys collect ortho mosaic images of the estuary as seen in the upper left. 
we can convert these orthomosaics to digital elevation models using a structure for motion software called PIX4D. Um, however, the method is typically used for stationary features. Um, so you can imagine that it sort of breaks down over the water. So kind of a lot of the preliminary work I've been doing is masking these images for water. So I'm using a k-means clustering algorithm. It's an image segmentation technique where um, you cluster the images, image pixels by color, and then combining this uh, clustering with a bathtub mask, we can do a pretty good job of removing the water pixels so we have digital elevation models without the water. So this leaves us with quarterly digital elevation models. From these DEMs, um, I've been conducting different maps, uh, computing different maps. So here's an example of one from January to April in 2019. So in the center and on the left, I'm showing the raw orthomosaic photos. And then on the right is the different map computed from the DEMs. You can see clearly that there is significant accretion at the mouth. Um, this is again supported by mouth photos on these days. But this is a pretty large time span. So what happened in between these two surveys? This is showing a time series from 2019. When we look at our sill height model, so sill height measure is shown in black, um, there's actually a near closure event in late January. And then the closure event that we saw in the previous slide began in mid, early to mid-April. So these are roughly correlated, um, as we can see, with uh, large waves coupled with weak discharge. Interestingly, during this time, there were large wave events that did not close the estuary, but we note that those were coupled with strong outflow. Um, luckily, we also have available to us the biweekly bi -weekly LIDAR surveys that Adam was discussing, which include do include the mouth of the estuary, um, though they don't go as far up the estuary as the drone surveys. So during this time period, I've computed different maps from each of the biweekly surveys, so we can see finer time scale changes. Ultimately, what we're seeing from this time period is that the mouth has accreted, um, but uh, it's ongoing work for us to look in finer detail at uh, more specific changes in the Long Beach, uh, in the Long Shore direction. So future work um, is, is definitely ongoing. Uh, the next step for me is to expand the 2D difference maps into volumetric change. Um, in an attempt to quantify the sediment budget at the mouth and then compare these to wave forcing and discharge. On the right, I'm showing a figure from the past four weeks. Um, so you can see this giant wave event that we had uh, in, in early January, four meter waves is shown um, here. Uh, and what I wanna highlight is that over this three month period, um, the green lines indicate when LIDAR surveys were conducted. So over this three month period, we have uh, over a dozen surveys collected. So um, I will be uh, diving in, in more detail to this finer time period, which as you saw earlier in the talk, experienced some very extreme change. All right, with that, I would like to thank um, especially all of our funding agencies, especially. Um, you can see they're, they're, uh, the agencies again listed on this slide. That, I will stop. Thank you so much, Alex. We really appreciate your presentation. Um, I think this brings us to our Q&A segment. So I'm going to pass it over to my Sea Grant colleagues. I know we've been getting some questions in the Q&A. So maybe you can um, read some of those for us and, and help us get, get the uh, Q&A kicked off. Yep, absolutely, Kristen. Uh, so Jeff had a question about um, whether Adam could help talk a little bit about the role of sand bypassing and inlet ma maintenance at places like San Alejo. Um, my understanding is that the bypassing is really critical for maintaining the volumes in, um, in Cardiff. I think Sri is, is, is here who just did a bunch of work on that. I'm not sure if you can let her answer that, she would be able to answer that a lot more thoroughly than me. Is that directed back at me, Adam? What's that? Is that directed back at me? 
No, Sri Sri Gopal is um is here as mm -hmm. an attendant who just did you know her um a bunch of work on that and, and wrote wrote that up. I don't know if she wants to say anything. Maybe Melissa, can you find Sri and the participants and just allow her to talk? It's S R E E. Right, my mouse is not working. There we go. Okay. Oh, allowed to talk. There we go. Three, you're on. Hey, can everyone hear me? Yes. Great. Um, so hi, uh, this is Sri Gopal. I I did a, a project working with uh, the Coastal Processes Group at Scripps looking at sediment budget projection for Cardiff State Beach, so specifically the San Alijo Lagoon. So what we found that was that uh, the routine bypassing every year of 16,000 cubic meters of sand was really critical to maintaining the beach width. So uh, even though that, uh, even though there, there have been um, major nourishment activities at, at Cardiff State Beach, the routine bypassing still plays an important role, like clearing the mouth, mouth inlet, inlet uh, of the lagoon plays a critical role in maintaining beach width. Not to mention, um, you know, um, the tidal circulation that, uh, you know, re-engages the ecosystem in the, in the lagoon itself. But just from a sediment budget perspective, we found that this is really important um, to keep the bypassing going. Was that your question, Jeff? Is there anything else? Yeah, that that was it. Thank you very much. I, I appreciate it. That's just, that's what I was looking for. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, so we have another question from Isabel. Uh, have you been able to use these data to model how the processes would differ if there were no man-made structures, example, bridges or man-made berms? Um. We haven't done a lot of modeling, mostly um, doing observations at this point, um, but that's something that we could definitely um, get into, but haven't done that yet. Okay. That's actually something that's part of um, a proposal that we've submitted recently that would look at different mouth morphologies and how that impacts um, circulation. However, it's not a two-way model. We're not we're not going to be having the sediment move in response to the hydrodynamics. So it would be taking different states of the mouth and the adjacent beach and then modeling the impacts. So that's something we're looking to do. And then I think Doug Gibson from the Nature Collective who works around the uh, lagoon as well. Doug, did you want to jump in and add anything to what was said? Yeah, I, I just uh, wanted to quickly add, San Aleo is unique um, in the lagoons that are sort of along the North County because we have a reef. And so that creates um, uh, a different metric that we look at. Now that we've restored the lagoon, our normal way of mechanically uh, bringing material out in, like we have for 25 years, uh, won't be able to be done because we actually increased the tidal velocity and prism so much that the back channel right there is acting as a bypass to sand moving all the way through the lagoon and on the other side of the rail bridge that can't be obtained by land equipment. So we are working on a white paper now to uh, better try to figure out how we're going to do this in the future. Alex, did you have any other, anything else you wanted to chime in on? No. All right. Uh, so next question, uh, Adam, do you see much loss of your um, in the tracked cobbles? And if so, what are the potential causes? Uh, that's a good question. Um, so we have typically, let's say they've been out about two and a half years at this point. Um, we typically, uh finding about 
30% of them. Um, and we don't know exactly where they're going, obviously, but sometimes they get covered with sand and they get buried and then we can't detect them once they're too deep. Um, but a lot of them are still there. We did lose quite a few after the last storm. Um, but they're, they're they're still around and they they you know sometimes they disappear for a few months and then we find them again. So um yeah, I'm not sure I hope that answers the question. Um but yeah, after two and a half years, we're still seeing quite a few of them. Um so they're they're and they're all you know they're within very close to where we released them. So that's um very interesting as far as trying to use them as a shoreline stabilization technique is that a lot of them are kind of hanging around within you know 50 meters of where we place them to begin with which is quite interesting great and um, we have another question and i have a tangent along with it so the question is does cobble along our shores impede or affect whether sand can naturally make its way back onto the shores and I guess similarly for you and Alex, do you see that the composition of the sills in the estuaries in terms of like percentage of cobble or even grain size, do you see that changing and or do you see that sort of impeding either mouth movement or um, tidal uh, flow? Um, as far as sand moving back to the beach I don't I don't think the cobble impedes it um I think the the sand can actually move into the you know into the voids within the cobble and build up inside there and then eventually cobbled um cover up the cobble berm so that's why sometimes you see uh the the beach can be very sandy or cobbly so the sand kind of moves in and out through the cobble basically but um to be honest we don't know a whole lot about that whole process and how much sand is in the berms and this winter we actually have a project where we're going to um, start digging in them um, a few times a year and kind of track to see how what to look at the internal composition of the cobble berms um, at Torrey Pines and Carlsbad. Of the story amount that I think it would be interesting, especially for these recent um this recent rapid change that we've had, which clearly had a lot of cobble to correlate these um morphologic 3D change to the, the composition as well. Um, but I would put the question to Sarah too to see if she has any additional um observations from, from the estuary mouth about cobble versus sand. I don't have um a great answer on that because that's not something we've specifically tracked like the fraction of which one but i just wanted to raise another question which is um once when these berms are formed whether they're all sand has happened some years or a mixture of cobble and sand has happens in other years um there is likely uh flow through them just like there's flow through the beach uh estuary interface away from the mouth as well and so I think like groundwater impacts is a is a question that is an important one to address and may play a role in erosion and and other aspects of this coupling between the beaches and the estuary mouths. So I guess related to that are you are any of you able to capture uh groundwater elevations during these periods or is that pretty much outside of our sphere of survey capability? Um, the same project where we're going to dig into the cobbles this winter, we're also installing um, sensors inside that we can monitor the water levels as well. But I don't, we don't think we have a whole lot of that information yet. Uh, well, Kristen, thank you. Uh, I'll let Kristen turn it over for the next set of panelists, but just thank you guys for great answers to great questions. Thank you. Thanks both Adam and Alex. I think uh, we had a 
couple questions for the audience that came from some of our presenters and that we can uh, post up again using Mentimeter. I don't know if Melissa, that's something you can put up or Laura, but um, same functionality. You can use um, your web browser or your cell phone. You can go to menti.com and use the code 36662732. Um, this was a question that came from one of our presenters and wanted to kind of poll the audience to, to learn a little bit more about your particular management needs. Uh, so this question is, what information is both critical and missing that you need to successfully manage our estuaries? And I see some answers are coming in. Um, effects of climate change on the opening and closing of estuary openings. Another one that came in is historical record of past opening and closings. You see sediment budgets coming up. I'm going to go in and put my own answer in. And for those of you who haven't used Mentimeter before, you can either just use your phone or web browser, type in menti.com and just use that code and you can offer your perspectives on information that's both critical and missing that you need to successfully manage our estuaries. Give folks a couple minutes here to submit. Another answer coming in, accurate water level data in the estuaries for a long enough time for long enough time periods. And this means capturing low flow. Mm, interdisciplinary needs such as impact on health, wellness, infrastructure, education, and economy. See statewide mapping and change detection, SOPs for estuaries. Also, change in geomorphological features of the estuarine habitat, such as tidal channels. Effects of sea level rise on multiple, multiple estuary habitats in concert. Someone has a more of a question. What is the relationship between mouth opening dynamics and hypoxia events? I see, Laurie, you're trying to make the screen a little smaller. Thanks. That's great. Um, an understanding of historical accretion rates of San Diego's estuaries, accurate sea level rise, predictive modeling within estuaries, and groundwater interactions will be great. Thank you so much. Oh, carbon storage potential. Locally relevant guidance. Everyone's estuaries are different. This is fantastic feedback. Thank you so much for um, providing your perspective on on critical and missing information that you would need to successfully manage our estuaries. I think with that, we're gonna to move to our next segment. Thank you again, Adam and Alex. Um, our next session is keeping estuaries healthy, innovation in monitoring stressors. So we will be hearing from Lisa Levin from the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. Um, her presentation will be benthic responses to mouth closure and hypoxia in Los Penasquitos Lagoon with comparison to Tijuana Estuary. And we'll also be hearing from Luke Miller with San Diego State University, Oysters as Biosensors, the Habitat Heartbeats Project. So with that, Lisa, I'll pass it on to you. Thanks so much. Okay. Can you hear me and see my screen? Okay. Both. Thanks, Lisa. Was that, I didn't quite catch that, but I assume that's a yes. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Okay. So thank you for the opportunity to present um, this work. You can, I'd like to start by acknowledging all my co-authors that you see here, who, who many of who've done the lion's share of the work I'll be talking about. We'll turn our attention to the biology and look at benthic response to mouth closure and hypoxia in Los Penasquitos Lagoon. And uh, let's see if I can advance here. What I'll be talking about is an analysis of some historical or what we call legacy benthos data collected over about a 15 year period that ended in the early 2000s for, Penis, for the benthos of Penasquitos Lagoon. And then I'll talk about some of the results of more recent sampling. Um, that our lab has done between 2019 and 2021, work led by Carlos Niera. And we set out to ask questions, um, and this is a 
a NOAA funded, CHRP NOAA funded project. Uh, we set out to ask what are the consequences of mouth closure and hypoxia for estuarine benthos, looking at effects on diversity and density and composition. And then with the modern work, we also asked whether those factors affected contaminant release. And uh, for the legacy work, we asked whether there are biological taxa or traits that might serve as sentinels or indicators of closure and hypoxia. In other words, how do the traits of the fauna respond to mouth closure and hypoxia? And overall, our goals were to inform decision-making and improve mouth management, enhance our um, you know, monitoring capacity to make the most of limited funds and, and to understand how the fauna responds to perturbations. So this work focused on data that was generated by historical sampling um, led by Joy Zedler in the earliest days and Jeff Crooks between 1991 and 2006 in Los Penasquitos Lagoon. And during that period, the lagoon was either closed very early on for extended periods or closed multiple times a year more recently, as everybody knows. And we also compared um, our findings to Benthos uh, from Tijuana monitoring conducted between 88 and 2004 when T and Tijuana estuary was open um, during that entire period, it never closed. So it was a open versus closed situation. Within Los Penasquitos Lagoon, we had good records of mouth closure and so, uh, and sampling was done seasonally. So we were able to ask questions about benthos during open versus closed mouth conditions. And there was also um, some um, point sampling of hypoxia, not long-term continuous sampling, but just episodic sampling. And when the records were less than two milligrams per liter for oxygen concentration, we called that hypoxia. And we examined the effects of hypoxia on benthos. We did this work separating out mouth, middle, and upper stations in Los Penasquitos and in Tijuana estuary as well. We conducted analysis of um, community composition and also biological traits, as I mentioned. And what we found was maybe not intuitively or maybe intuitively, we found that the mouth closure of Los Penasquitos actually raises the density and richness of the benthos, but only at the mouth. So, um, and the other stations in the middle and upper zones really didn't change significantly when the mouth was open versus closed. So higher densities and higher species richness or diversity when the mouth is closed than when it's open. But we found that mouth closure affects the composition of the fauna at all stations, middle mouth and upper with different groups dominating, especially during closure, more, more capitellid polychaetes, more trans amphipods, trans Transgorchetsia, more sna snails, bivalves, and furonids during mouth closure. Uh, I mentioned we conducted a biological traits analysis. What this involves is compiling the faunal count data, developing trait categories, encoding them, and then assigning functional traits to each benthic species, developing a trait matrix, and then assigning each sample a mouth status and a hypoxia status, a location and a season. And then we use multidimensional scaling to look at changes in traits, weighted and unweighted. And what we found was that, um, not surprisingly, mouth status affects biological traits, just as it does composition. And closure of the lagoon favored soft body, non-bioturbating, mobile, epifaunal taxa with planktotrophic development, that's a feeding larvae, and large branchy and no vision. So there's a suite of traits that changes when the mouth closes. We also looked at instantaneous measures of hypoxia, as I mentioned, and the main effect we found uh, of hypoxia was that it suppresses seasonality. So normally the benthic densities are highly seasonal. You can see differences between winter, spring, summer, and fall when the conditions are hypoxic, densities are lower and um, basically there is no seasonality. So this it doesn't co correspond directly to what happens when the mouth is closed. 
Um, we did find hypoxia alters taxonomic composition, but did not affect diversity. So we had certain taxa that were um, more common with hypoxia, crowfoot amphipods, some small snails, tubifid oligochaetes, and shrimp, and trichorexa. Um, but and we found that there were certain traits associated with hypoxia. We hypoxia tended to select for either very small or very large animals, animals with um, vision, and marginally animals with calcification, which is not what we would have predicted. We then went ahead and compared the historical pen Los Penasquitos data to Tijuana estuary, and not surprisingly, we found higher densities and higher species richness in Tijuana than in Los Penasquitos. We found different composition, we found more amphipods in, in Los Penasquitos, or Castilla when closed and Corophids when open. And we found other many other taxa that were more abundant in Tijuana estuary. And we found different biological traits as well with Tijuana hosting more burrowing, large bodied, highly calcified taxa with planktotrophic development and no vision. Um, but what we, was interesting is so many of these differences really were focused on the mouth or middle stations and the upper reaches of both Tijuana and Los Penasquitos. In fact, the, the had very similar benthos and similar biological traits. One of the things we note is that these differences here are probably not only due to mouse status, but also to the heavy nutrient input that Tijuana uh, that comes from Tijuana City, whereas uh, we don't have that same level of nutrient input in Los Penasquitos. So I want to turn now to the modern sampling, um, which began in 2019. Um, this was work really fun funded by Parks and Rec uh, in the uh, State of California Natural Resources Division. And um, Carlos Niera led this work. One of the main questions was whether lagoon closure alters persistent organic pollutant loading. And you can see the four POPs we, we examined over here on the right. And, um, and then did this in turn affect faunal community structure and functional diversity. And this was um, unlike the seasonal sampling that I've just described, the historical sampling, this was event-based sampling. And uh, so, so that it looks specifically at mouth dredging and mouth closure and a red tide, which I'll talk about. Um, so we sought to identify areas with high levels of organic pollutant, evaluate the effects of mouth closure and mechanical disturbance associated with reopening on pollutant availability and examine how these impact macrobenthus communities, including the myo macrofaunal size myofauna. And I don't have enough time to go through all the results uh, with in detail, but I wanna summarize them. Um, that really we found that persistent organic pollutants occur mainly at really low concentrations. We found that PAHs and PCBs exhibit a si significant positive correlation with total organic carbon, and therefore they're more abundant at the inner stations. Um, in Los Penasquitos, we found that PAHs were um, the most frequent of these four contaminants examined, followed by PCBs, but they never really exceeded the sediment ERL sediment quality guidelines. Um, we found that organochlorinated pesticides and other emerging chemicals like PBDEs were sporadically detected, but they also were at low concentration. Every once in a while, DDT exceeded the ERL guidelines posing some risk potentially, but there was a lot of variability in sediment contaminant levels over time. And these really result from the highly dynamic processes uh, uh, that occur at the mouth and along the lagoon tidal channels. And you've been hearing about these. Um, we looked at the benthic responses to dredging and um, you can see a dramatic fall in density um, at, at dredge stations. These are data um, compiled from both uh, conditions in 2020 and 2021. It recovers a little bit slowly right after post dredging, but composition is also different. So we found in the modern in, in 1920 to 21, the densities were lower at the mouth than at the upriver stations. 
um, that mechanical disturbance caused significant reductions in, in benthos density, shifts in composition and loss of biodiversity relative to sites that are not disturbed or less disturbed. Um, that mechanical disturbance contributes to spatial heterogeneity and that there were certain groups which seemed to do much better when the sediments were not dredged or disturbed, nematodes, dubophysids, and other benthic groups you see here. Closure and, dense, uh, and dredging reduces density and alters composition. And here are some data from a specific event um, at th the three sites, Northwest, Northeast, and Southeast in Los Penasquitos. And the main thing that was found is that densities of the big myofauna, these are animals retained on a macrofaunal size screen, but they're things like nematodes and copepods. They're very high at some of these stations, but um, when the lagoon closes, the densities go down, particularly of the myofauna rather than the larger bodied um, macrofaunal taxa. We found more tubophysids and nematodes when the mouth was open and more ostracods and amphipods when the mouth is closed. So there's definitely changes in the benthos, which probably means changes in the supply of food for birds and uh, fishes. And the, the last thing I wanna talk about is um, our, the response to the red tide that was uh, occurred, most of you are familiar with this, in late April and May of 2020. Um, this was the result of a combination of factors, probably heavy precipitation, uh, warmer temperatures, stratification, excess nitrates, low winds, and then a big, big bloom of Ligulodinium polyhedra, which um, decayed and led to oxygen loss. So we had massive hypoxia in the coastal zone. It was detected first off, you know, it was detected off scripts on the open coast before it was detected in the estuaries in Los Penasquitos and Agua Hedionda. And, um, but, but basically the red tide washed in from the coastal waters and then the lagoon closed. And we studied the benthic response to red tide. These are all um, densities at the three different interstations um, in Los Penasquitos. And you can see during the red tide and mouth closure densities went way, way down at all of these stations. Um, but that was within the lagoon. At the mouth stations, the densities went up, especially we had two mouth stations that were sampled frequently. And at one of them, the one closest, uh, well, I forget exactly where they are, but but they're very close to each other and they're at the mouth. And so densities went up at one and um, went up more slowly at the other one, but they are different responses. And the main point here is there's an awful lot of spatial heterogeneity in the lagoon and not everything responds the same way. So composition changed during the red tide at the stations with more marine influence. We got more tubifacid oligochaetes and we got loss of nematodes. And um, in the stations further inland, we got decline of oligochaetes and more copepods and ostracods. We also had mass mortalities during the red tide of some of the larger taxa. So these are pictures not quantified, but there were dead snails, dead tagalus, um, visible dead protothaca and dead oysters um, and a lot of black spots that produced by the decay of these mollusks in the Los Penasquito sediments. So to close up, I just wanna try to summarize what, you know, what we think we've learned from these studies. Um, clearly the definition of what's, what's a healthy system and healthy benthos differs for the mouth, middle, and the upper estuaries. Each of these areas has different taxa and different traits and different dynamics and different responses to mouth closure and even to hypoxia. Um, we found that largely open low inflow estuaries like Tijuana support higher diversity, and this is true in the literature, but intermittently closed systems like Los Penasquitos do contribute to a broader pattern of richer, richness and support different kinds of species. Um, we were kind of, we never got too far in trying to, in finding in good indicator taxa, but we did find that amphipods, some small gastropods and some of the bivalves seem to respond most to closure and hypoxia and that they could be um, good indicator species. 
we found that there are a number of biological traits that are sensitive to closure and hypoxia, body size, vision, calcification, carnivory, the, it's a long list, dwelling habitat, bioturbation, and dispersal. And all of these things could affect the services like trophic support for resident and migratory fish and birds and nutrient remineralization and carbon burial. So all of these changes probably do have implications, but they would have to be steady and more detailed to pin them down. Um, we do believe that event-based monitoring is really important for detection of biological impacts of things like mouth closure or mechanical dredging or red tides. You can't necessarily capture these with quarterly uh, monitoring, as was done in the historical work. Uh, and we know now that these do shape um, the low inflow estuary benthos, but we believe that contaminants are not really a problem in Los Penasquitos for the most part. And, um, and that contaminant availability is not really affected by closure and dredging. And I'll, I'll um, stop there and turn over to Luke. And I, I do wanna thank the many people who contributed to all these data um, and the many funding agencies, especially the NOAA Center for Coastal Ocean Science, which funded the large part of this and California Department of Parks and Rec, and also the many other people listed here who've contributed to or enabled or facilitated our both our field work and our historical work. So thank you. Thank you so much, Lisa, for your presentation. We'll move to Luke Miller, Oysters as Biosensors, the Habitat Heartbeats Project. And then following Luke's presentation, we'll move into a Q&A segment. Take it away, Luke. Well, good morning. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, some, some, some work we've been doing as part of a, the National Estuarine Research Reserve Systems Science Collaborative Project. Uh, our collaborators are shown here, myself uh, from San Diego State University, my master's student, Gabriella Kalbach, and then Kristen right there, and uh, Jeff Crooks from Tijuana River NUR and uh, Sarah Giddings from Scripps. And uh, what I'll talk about today is, is a project that's sort of been in process uh, in some form or another for a couple of years. But uh, with this uh, funding from the Science Collaborative, we're really sort of working towards trying to make um, bi common bivalves in our local estuaries, such as oysters and mussels, uh, into something like a biosentinel, that is a living animal that can potentially tell us something about conditions in these waterways in real time. And so uh, what we've been doing is, 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 as part of this project, is developing and hopefully perfecting a set of sensors that tell us something about behavior, such as opening and closing the shell valves, and um, physiology, such as tracking heart rate, that um, we can record over long term, but also have um, real-time uh, updates of that going up to the web, to a website, so that uh, some a manager or someone could could potentially keep track of things along with the existing water quality reporting uh, systems that are already in place in, in um, places like our local local estuaries. So I'll talk about two of the two of the variables, bi biological variables that we've been measuring here. So we're measuring gaping behavior, that is the opening and closing of the two halves of a shell valve. So the uh, picture over here on the far left is a uh, little illustration of what is a, a, a Hall effect sensor. It senses a magnetic field. So when we take a magnet and glue it to one of the shells and then put our Hall effect sensor opposite those opposite that magnet, uh, as the shells get closer together, we get a particular voltage out of it. As the two halves of the shell get farther apart, we get a different changing voltage. And we can run wires off of this particular sensor back to a data logger and record those changes. So on the far right here is an image of one of those sensors in the process of being glued onto a uh, Cressostra gigas. Uh, there's a, the magnet is a little bit hard to make out there, but it is, it is also glued right there. We're, I mentioned heart rate as as our physiological metric that we're we're interested in as well. And for anyone in the 
in the audience today who's wearing an Apple Watch or a Fitbit that reports to you your pulse, your heart, uh, your heart rate, uh, that we're using the same basic sensor as those devices use. So it, uh, those watches sort of shine a little light into the capillaries in your wrist and record the changing, uh, changing sort of light field being reflected back from your from your pulsing capillaries and convert that into a heart rate. What we've done is taken one of those sorts of chips, uh, microchips here, put it on a little carrier board. Again, we attach wires to it to send that signal back to a data logger, and we can uh, attach that thing to the outside of the muscle, similar to what we did with the Hall effect sensor. And so in this case, it's shining infrared light through the calcium carbonate shell of a muscle or a big oyster. And those shells are are uh, sort of translucent enough when it comes to infrared that that light will go in, it will hit anything sort of moving inside the shell, get reflected back and picked up by that by the sensor. And so over here on the right here, we've got a little live trace of the heart rate of this muscle that Gabby is holding in her hand in the foreground. And we can record that sort of thing at high frequency over long periods of time and then work and you know, calculate a heart rate from it. So um, both of these sensors are designed to be effectively non-invasive. We can glue them to the outside of the shell and not have to do any sort of drilling or surgery or anything on these animals. That also means that they're potentially long-lived. So we can have these sensors attached to animals for, at this point, months at a time, hopefully years at a time, and have them continue just, uh, just recording data in th throughout that time period. Um, as I mentioned, the, another part of this project is to try to turn some of these data streams into, into real-time data streams. So traditionally, what we've done is recorded those heart rate data or those gape data on a uh, micro SD card on a little data logger like the thing pictured here. And then you got to go out and download it every couple of, couple of months. Um, that's really nice for having uh, high frequency, really detailed data, but um, it would also obviously be nice to not have to uh, go out into the field to see what the live conditions are. So in this case, Case, what we what I've been doing is developing a little a little adapter board here that fits onto a uh, existing product that's on the market. It's called the Enviro DIY uh, Mayfly data logger. So this uh, this data logger has the facility to. Uh, run a solar charger. It has a, uh, you can mount a cellular modem on it. You can hook up all kinds of water sensors, but what we're doing here is sort of modifying it to, to uh, use one of these bio sensors. So we can have inputs for eight separate uh, gate sensors here that will run out to eight separate animals. And over time, it will go ahead and connect to the web over the cell network and broadcast some uh, data. So on the far right, there are some examples um, from our, from our test test uh, test boards uh, sort of showing you animals uh, oysters in this case are going through opening and closing periods so the high values are when they are open the low values are when they are closed and this is just over the course of two days I think it's showing you maybe three days um, but the point is to be able to have have that facility out in the field and I suppose you know one of the advantages of these uh, these urban wetlands is that generally there's pretty good cell coverage so you can get away with this kind of uh, this kind of service rather than need necessarily needing a satellite. So uh, those sensors that we attach to the animals have wires coming back from them uh, going into watertight boxes here. And so we've got uh, one of these cell modem data loggers attached here. This uh, data logger in the middle is one of our custom built uh, heart rate sensor data loggers. And then we have the uh, sort of uh, power management uh, facilities to uh, uh, take power from a solar panel recharge a battery so we can power this thing basically continuously for months at a time. The solar panel is oversized for, for the amount of power that um, these two devices actually use. They're, they're built to uh, sort of minimize their power usage as much as possible. So we can put those little watertight boxes out at the estuary edge, run our cables uh, down to the animals and, and start recording that way. So this is an example of, of one of our deployments that uh, my student Gabby has been uh, has been running down in uh, South San Diego Bay near the old uh, salt ponds. They're highlighted by the yellow star on that inset image on the right. Uh, and what she's been doing is tracking some sets of oysters at two different shore heights on the benthos uh, at plus two foot above the mean lower low water and plus three foot above the mean lower low water. So they're separated by about 30 centimeters vertically, but both sitting on the channel edge here in 
in, in one of the main channels, not far from the, uh, the system-wide monitoring program, uh, water sensors just offshore there. So these cables run back to the boxes. The boxes are perched fairly high, just in case the water levels get, get particularly high here. Um, but we've also got a dissolved oxygen sensors alongside so we can keep track of temperature and dissolved oxygen uh, conditions for these animals during uh, during low, high tide, certainly, and then they're in the air during low tide. And so at certain times of the tide cycle, there these animals are going to come out of the water twice a day and have to sit there for a couple of hours. And being marine critters that are filter feeders, they're not necessarily particularly happy in those conditions. And so we're interested in, in how they're responding behaviorally and physiologically in that that cycling from high tide to low tide from maybe favorable conditions to less certainly less favorable conditions. So I'll show you some data here from, uh, this is valve gape. So this is opening and closing of the shells. These are from our low shore animals that are uh, two foot above mean lower low water. And each of the eight little panels here represents a time series from an individual Crassostriate gigas in this case. So values that are above zero, mean that the animal is open and time periods where the the values are down at zero all the way down highlighted in these blue boxes represent periods of closure and in this case tied to aerial exposure and so what you see for these low shore animals is that during the neap portion of the two-week tide cycle they're in some cases having to close up twice a day or sorry once a day for a couple of hours but as you move into the spring tide cycle where both the lower low tide and the higher high tide each day are low enough to immer immerse these animals in the air, um, they are having to actually close up twice a day for a couple of hours. As soon as that water comes back and submerges them, you see this very fast uh, sort of rise in the in the opening of our gape signal. So they're very quickly reopening, presumably trying to restart uh, um, aerobic respiration, getting some oxygen out of the water that's now flowing through them and also presumably starting to feed. Similar sort of data for our high shore animals, and really the, the difference here, again, only a 30 centimeter height difference, but we do see some evidence of slightly longer um, periods of immersion and slightly longer periods of closure as a result. Um, but what I also want you to take away from this is that we see some pretty consistent um, group responses to this at least pretty pretty severe um, signal of going out of the water and no longer being able to breathe or feed in the water. So um, the animals are pretty consistent under that kind of, of sort of very binary uh, uh, set of conditions. There is also a fair bit of, of inner individual variation among individuals, particularly when they are submerged and able to potentially feed. So this uh, set of box plots here, again, represents data from each of the eight animals up on the high shore in the sort of pinkish boxes and the low shore in the bluish boxes. And what these are are uh, sort of aggregated, aggregated data for hours spent open per day, so at more than 0% open. Um, across multiple weeks, showing you that for both of these sites, high and low, again, only separated by 30 centimeters, there's a reasonable amount of, of overlap between those two groups. They're spending about the same amount of time um, with their shells open because they're spending roughly the same amount of time uh, submerged at these two shore heights. The other way we've been doing this is putting animals on more floating moorings in the uh, in this in the uh, estuary channel. So we've been doing this in the Tijuana River estuary and Los Penasquitos Lagoon, um, again, with animals with gape sensors and with heart sensors. Uh, and uh, in this case, then we're removing that, that, uh, that effect of Im aerial immersion during low tide and really looking at sort of small spatial scale differences in the water column between animals that are uh, held near the surface at our float and animals that are sitting just above the, uh, the channel bottom here. And so I'll just show you a little bit of example data here from uh, late in the year. Um, and so what I'm going to highlight here are a set of three days just following a rain event. So the very top uh, plot here is rainfall. And then uh, we've got multiple other environmental value, uh, variables here, along with gape opening and heart rate. And so we're going to zoom in on those a uh, couple of days right after that rainfall event. And what I want you to see First, in the gape data is this group uh, shutdown, closure of the valves, uh, brief reopenings, and then another prolonged uh, closure. And this is happening overnight here. 
What I also want you to take away is that we see this decline in heart rate when these animals are closing down. Presumably, they are trying to conserve some of their uh, limited oxygen that is that is held within the shells during that closure period. There's no point in really rapidly pumping around a bunch of constantly deoxygenating blood, presumably. We see a brief increase in heart rates when they briefly reopen and then that decline again. And the same sort of pattern occurs on, on those subsequent days as well. And what the signal is for that is not necessarily clear. We do see um, these, these closures happening sort of as, as the low tide is actually increasing again in each of these periods. Uh, there are these spikes in turbidity that are happening in each of these cases as well, but and salinity is sort of moving in different ways uh, during these periods. So there's still a fair bit to be done in terms of linking these behaviors and uh, physiological responses to individual or groups of uh, environmental data, but that is part of our goal. And then um, Alex Simpson and, and Lisa both uh, referenced these, uh, these red tide events, and I'll just show you a little bit of data uh, from our oysters that we put out into the middle of this very ugly red tide when the mouth maintenance was happening back in spring of 2020. And in this case, uh, here I'm just showing you some, again, uh, physical data. The uh, mouth maintenance period is highlighted in blue. You see the change or sort of the uh, muting of the change in uh, water level because the tides are cut off here. You see a, a uh, long-term decline in salinity as freshwater is building up behind that closed mouth. And you see this massive crash in uh, 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 oxy dissolved oxygen that is at least in part presumably linked to the uh, lingulodinium uh, red tide, uh, water that was being pulled in and then trapped inside the mat inside the lagoon there. So we put out a couple of oysters at the surface of a mooring and at the, near the bottom of the channel uh, in the middle of that maintenance period. And so the blue box here is still when the mouth was being worked on. And what we see is that the animals were mostly pretty unhappy. They were staying fairly closed when we first dumped them in there. We see a little bit of evidence of opening for some of them. And what we also see is anytime you see this line basically go up and stay up, it means those animals died. So the animals at the bottom on the right were all very unhappy. Happy. The animals at the uh, surface, two of them survived and two of them died. So I will leave it here. There's contact information if you have questions and maybe thoughts about where this kind of real-time monitoring uh, might be useful to you. And again, acknowledge our uh, funding sources, including the Neuroscience Collaborative. And also some of these data um, were collected as part of the Coastal Hypoxia Research Program uh, grant to, uh, to Lisa and uh, Sarah Giddings and, and Jeff and those folks. So thank you. Thank you so much, Luke. Really exciting work. I um, wanted to encourage anyone who might have any questions to use the Q&A function. And um, this is going to open up our segment to, to ask any questions of Lisa and Luke in, in their work. And Laura, I can pass it to you if you have anything in the queue. Um, I don't see I don't see anything in the queue, but I specifically have a question um, for Lisa and Luke, and it does relate to the sense for understanding uh, thresholds. And so do you think that we could use both the biosensor project and then sort of combinations of um, density in terms of the uh, you know, the species stratification across the estuary, as well as sort of their geographic locations. Like, do you see that as like compiled together, we can sort of get some sense for what species have what specific thresholds, whether that's um, like, you know, exposure to certain events. I mean, I like the episodic monitoring comments and I think it's really interesting. And so it gets me to this question of like, can we understand better understand thresholds for some species and whether they are indeed going to be able to adapt to changing conditions going forward. I don't know who wants to go first. I mean, my my thought is that the threshold concept works, might work okay for big iconic species like oysters, you know, or mussels like what Luke is studying, but for the small invertebrates that I was discussing, I'm not sure it makes sense to decide that there is a very specific species for which we care about the threshold 
if there are other species performing the same functions. You know, we tend to view them as assemblages more than species, you know, specific management, like you might do for an endangered or threatened species or a commercially valuable species. So they are the food for other species that we care about, these benthos. And so maybe understanding whether some of those species have more or lesser value uh, for the services we care about, the migratory birds or the fish or whatever it is, you know, juvenile fishes, um, might allow us to work with thresholds. But um, I mean, right now we work, I'm not sure, maybe I'm interpreting the question wrong because certainly we work with oxygen thresholds. You know, we define hypoxia a specific way, but even that is really um, arbitrary. You know, different species have different tolerances. It's not like once you get to two milligrams per liter and below all the species die, that doesn't happen. Yeah, I mean, I'll just I'll piggyback on that and say that the the sort of multivariate nature of the physiological response that something like an oyster or a mussel has is, you know, it certainly has been a, a, a thing of interest to to physiologists for decades, generations. And, you know, I think we're still even just now start starting to tease away how how certain combinations of, of conditions are going to are going to um, you know trigger whether it's behavioral responses, physiological responses, or something like mortality events. Um, I mean, it's it's ungodly complicated once you've got three or four or five different uh, water quality variables that could all be all be uh, uh, driving things or or at least influencing the overall response of the animal. But it's something that uh, certainly interests me and my 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 sort of physio physiology background. So it's something I want to keep keep pushing for because you know again if 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 part of our goal is to have some biosentinel species that might be useful for managers, it really is going to take um, identifying some thresholds or combinations of of conditions that you know should sound the alarm and say some so conditions have gotten bad enough that we're maybe going to start seeing mass die-offs or or other other negative impacts. Thanks. So we have somewhat of a related question about um, the potential for the for the application of this information to aquaculture and all also piggyback on that because a couple of our sea grant colleagues are looking at breeding for um, restoration purposes. And also I think doing some experiments related to, again, can you sort of slowly expose some of these mollusks to um, hypoxic or other conditions and like maybe mature them in a way that they're able to adapt a little better. So maybe that's one application, but I'd love for your feedback as well. I mean, as part as as part of our project, we have been uh, working or working to identify potential partners. So we've been um, uh, we are targeting a, a deployment actually in the San Diego Bay on the Flupsy, the uh, floating upwelling pr pr platform. Excuse me, um, to use as as a, as a sort of test bed for animals or oysters in this case that are that are in sort of what we might consider pretty good conditions, at least for them in comparison to the uh, the estuaries uh, in terms of having fairly stable salinity and fairly stable temperatures and all the and oxygen and so forth. So we are we are definitely working that direction in in terms of. Uh, trying to build a product that might actually, or, or at least a system that might actually be um, usable by, by uh, aquaculture practitioners. I will say that uh, you know, from a, from a, a, a sort of functional standpoint, our sensors do require an animal that is, you know, somewhat, somewhat mature. It's not, not something that's so small you can attach to spat, um, which, you know, that, that sort of maybe very sensitive stage of the life cycle. Um, we don't necessarily have the ability to put real-time sensors on animals that small, but I suppose there is the question of how how much overlap there is between what the big animals, the adults, are are uh, responding to versus what the spat are responding to. But yeah, that's definitely something we're we're interested in pursuing is is making 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 a system that other folks might uh, might find useful to monitor their animals.
Laura, you're muted. <laughs> Sorry, I was saying, Lisa, do you want to add anything to that? Uh, no, I mean, I, I, yeah, I, Luke is the expert there. Um, what about this question, which is, do you have any insights into the effects of natural versus managed breaching events on estuary biology? That one might be for you, Lisa. Yeah, I mean, well, my sense is that the mechanical breaching that we do um, as management is definitely more disruptive of the sediments and probably probably has a bitter, bigger impact on the benthos than the natural events, but we have not done the same sort of event-based sampling around natural breaching events. And it's rare, but we get to see natural breaching events, I think, because usually managers step in and open the lagoon when it closes. I might be wrong there. But it's a good question. And for Luke, we have a question about uh, whether the sensors could be used on native oysters and whether another person asks, would you expect the native oysters to have the same responses as the C dot gigas, if I'm saying that correctly? <laughs> Yeah, so so one of my other students is actually working up in Newport, uh, in the uh, up in Upper Newport Bay, with the native oysters, Austria, um, putting the same heart and gape sensors on those on those somewhat littler animals. So, you know, they're sort of the size of a half dollar um, at, at the point that she's putting able to put sensors on them, and that is kind of close to our lower limit in terms of size. But so she has been uh, working on that on that project with just the native oyster up in Newport, and we haven't done necessarily the side by side comparison. Comparisons uh, yet, but that's certainly something that we could pursue, given that we've sort of done the done the at least proof of concept that it's going to work on work on the natives, work on the uh, introduced species. It'll work on the mussels and and so on. So, um, yeah, certainly certainly a, an interesting interesting avenue to pursue. All right, I've got a few more questions, and I'm also going to throw up the next mentee soon here in a minute for you guys to help contribute. Uh, Darren at State Parks uh, wants to know, so the Sandy Inlet at Los Penasquitos is really different in disturbance regime, meaning annual maintenance, substrate, sandy versus silty and dynamics, um, when compared to habitats outside the inlet maintenance footprint. Can diversity measures be compared between these two worlds? So can we if I'm understanding that correctly, can we sort of measure the diversity responses both within the inlet and just outside the inlet based on these disturbance events? So you're at, at, at to ask, is the question about the open coastal system or comparison of the mouth system to the inner estuary? Uh, that's what I'm not understanding. I mean, clearly the mouth is different than all the other Los Penasquitos stations and, and yet the diversity the actual diversity metrics aren't particularly different when the mouth is closed but when the mouth is open diversity is much lower than it is further up up estuary um, in terms of outside on the open coast beach where it's a dynamic situation all the time with um you know i, I would suggest expect certainly more dynamic than even at the mouth of the estuary. I don't know that I would try to draw a direct comparison with diversity metrics. But I'm not I'm not sure I understood the question completely. I, yeah, I'm sorry. I, I, I didn't get out of very clearly. Um what I I guess what I was trying to trying to look at was, you know, that that basin, that inner basin of the inlet, we do kind of the same thing every year that we've been doing for more than 20 years. And so it's sort of almost a you know, measuring diversity in there is you're measuring, you know, the one year cycle between when the inlet gets maintained and, and the next year when it gets maintained again. And so diversity yeah. is going to kind of flow up and down based on that, that pattern probably. Um, and just, 
looking at diversity in that zone compared to any other zone in the estuary is kind of such a different uh, a different kind of place. Um, and I guess the 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 only thing to compare it to might be Tijuana estuary where you know it doesn't get maintained or some other inlet that's not getting the same frequency of maintenance in that same kind of sandy dynamic location in the in the outer inlet. Well, and that was exactly why we drew the comparisons to Tijuana, where which does have higher density and diversity than mm -hmm. than the um, Los Penn stations that are maintained regularly. Yeah. So, so I mean, you're right, and and really, the the goal of the study was to just try to understand what we're what what has our management yeah. been doing to the system. Yeah. So. And, and then I guess the question, I mean, the big question that we have to do for you is let it close up for a couple of years and then uh, and then see what happens. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the the management has selected for short lived species that, you know, do well it, it, with annual life cycles. And and, um, you know, there there's a lot of opportunistic species there. And that's really what tends to persist at the at the mouth further upstream that's not the case you know there's there's not so much disruption of the mouth opening upstream for the benthos yeah i, I keep thinking of kind of with terrestrial stuff and the intermediate disturbance hypothesis and it'd be fun to mess around with the disturbance frequency <laughs> and, and see what happens yep darren wants to be a disturber are you disturbing things darren <laughs> i'm disturbed <laughs> um well why why don't we go ahead and tap into the current menti question which uh is a good one about do you see you different ways that the oyster biosensor uh method might have utility in other sites or situations yeah uh, well, we thank our panelists and uh, there are a few remaining Q and A's. And so I'm just gonna actually put those questions into the chat for everyone. And then if any of our panelists feel that they have a helpful answer to those, then feel free to chime in. Thank you so much, Laura. And thank you, Lisa and Luke. I'm seeing some contributions pop in on Menti. I, uh, for those of you who haven't um, participated in Menti before or just joining us a little later in the meeting, you can go to menti.com either on your phone or on a website. And what you can see here are some answers coming in. It looks like this was a question that Luke posed to participants around living in July. And Laura, I'm gonna put you on, on mute here for a moment. Um, Looks like Luke, some answers are coming in from participants, um, maybe utility in living shorelines or focusing on success of restoration projects, potentially um, looking at tracking ecosystem services, closing and opening of beaches for public water contact. Um, here's, here's a contribution. Oyster reefs are planned by the city of San Diego to stabilize banks in Mission Bay. Could monitoring the health of these oysters be a measure of water quality in general? Um, there's a comment in here too that um, there might be some possibility implications um, with equipment and placement. So visible equipment would be prone to theft in estuaries with more public access. Um, perhaps thinking about placement in more closed areas like Bolsa Chica or Seal Beach. So um, we'll keep, as Laura mentioned, we'll keep this Menti open. Please keep uh, providing feedback. This is a great question. Thanks, Luke, for asking it. And I think we'll move into our next segment here, um, also on contaminants and pollutants. We'll be hearing from Trent Biggs with San Diego State University. He'll be presenting on the real-time monitoring of sediment and sewage contamination in the Tijuana River and estuary. And then following Trent, Sarah Giddings with the Scripps Institution of Oceanography, um, her presentation, how do estuarine outflows interact with surf zone breaking waves and spread in the coastal ocean? I'll also just note that we're about halfway through our time together, so feel free to take a moment, a stretch, a deep breath. There's some amazing information coming through. I see Trent taking a breath himself. <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll hand it off to you, Trent. Thank you so much. Great. Thanks, uh, thanks Kristen. Uh, let me get set up here. Okay, do you see the presenter view or do you see the uh, full view, uh, Kristen? 
I see the presenter view right now, Trent. Okay, let me sw uh, swap screens. Uh, oh, shoot. Yeah, there we go. Perfect. Okay, great. So um, hi, everybody. Thanks uh, very much to the conveners for the invitation. Happy to present uh, uh, this uh, today um, on real time and remote monitoring of sediment and sewage contamination in the Tijuana River and estuary. Um, I'm Trent Biggs. I'm at San Diego State University, and this is a joint project uh, among several different departments at San Diego State. The Civil Engineering Department with Natalie Mladenov, uh, Field Stations, uh, Pablo Bryant, and Geography, Dan Souza. And a lot of uh, students have been involved, um, uh, and their participation is gratefully acknowledged. Um, Doug Leiden and uh, Yang Ping Yuan from the EPA are also uh, involved in the project conceptualization. Many thanks to Jeff, uh, Jeff Crooks and, uh, and colleagues at uh, Turner and California Parks. And um, some of the remote sensing component of the hyperspectral imagery is, is being led by um, Omar Zarita Jibe. And funding for this um, started out with the JW Sefton Foundation, a, um, a family, family foundation here in San Diego. And then um, the Tijuana River monitoring part is, has been funded by the EPA with a lot of support from NOAA Sessurst, which has supported uh, uh, the uh, uh, several students on the way and the remote sensing component, uh, which is coming up by NASA. Okay. Here we go. All right, so the motivation is everyone knows uh, that's on this call, um, sediment loads and sewage contaminations are problems uh, in the Tijuana uh, River estuary. Uh, but the Tijuana River itself, uh, especially storm flow, hasn't really been sampled regularly since about 2014. There's been a few special studies here and there, but not regularly and never continuously or in real time. Um, and part of the problems with that monitoring is that samples are time consuming and uh, expensive to collect a, and analyze. Uh, so, um, Here's an illustration from our most recent event of the discharge that's uh, happening in the Tijuana River. So you get storm flow events uh, following um, a, a rain event. And then after that, several days of sort of periodic and diurnally oscillating sewage releases. Um, and you can see that those sewage releases are, are persistent for several days to weeks uh, after storm events. So we really, really wanna know how do we characterize the water quality of those, um, of those events. So the Tijuana estuary is monitored in real time by Turner uh, and, and Jeff Crook's team. They have two stations that they're, that they've, uh, where they're collecting dissolved oxygen, salinity, turbidity, and uh, some data on uh, chromomorphic dissolved, uh, chromophoric dissolved organic matter. Um, and we wanna be able to turn this kind of information as well as some other specialized flora, flora metric sensors into estimates of not only sediment, but bacteria concentrations over, over space and time and how they change throughout the whole system. Um, so our longer term, our short-term goals are to establish uh, real-time information about sediment loads and sewage contamination in different parts of the estuary, river estuary complex. And secondly, to understand how the estuary uh, retains and processes sediment and sewage. Okay, so one opportunity for realizing those goals is to utilize fluorescence. Um, and they can be indicators of wastewater and bacteria. So tryptophan-like fluorescence in particular can be a proxy for uh, sewage and, and bacteria, uh, as well as chromophoric uh, dissolved organic matter. And those are uh, detectable with sensors uh, that can be left in the water and connected telemetry to telemetry for real time. And some work done by Natalie Bladenov's lab uh, suggests that adding um, the tryptophan-like fluorescence correlates pretty closely with uh, bacteria concentrations 
in laboratory settings when you add wastewater uh, to uh, to distilled water in a um, in a laboratory experiment. So we wanted to test drive this. So the second opportunity is uh, remote sensing. There's both near surface hyperspectral where you can have a camera perma camera permanently monitor, uh, mounted near the ground, a couple um, meter to a couple meters off the ground that can give you more or less continuous information. It's not affected by clouds and lots of uh, uh, bands. Uh, and then there's satellite based, which are can be daily down to three meters resolution for planet. Um, so we wanted to understand how accurate is in C2 uh, proxy based and fluorescence based uh, sensing of bacteria. How can remote sensing supplement in C2 sensors to map contamination? And what are the spatial and temporal patterns of sediment and sewage in the T1 River and estuary? So um, we have two in situ sensors that's that have been installed at the Boca Rio site in green and the uh, Tijuana River site in blue, and um, those consist of a onshore onshore data uh, data logger with solar panel. We also have cameras that are powering this. Is one reason why our solar panel is bigger. Um, but then we have a relatively small sonde deployed there uh, at, at both of these locations. And these are what they look like. There's a buoy with a sound housing. Here's where we have a hyperspectral camera uh, mounted that uh, reports uh, data uh, frequently. I forget the, the reporting interval, but on the order of minutes. And then at the uh, IBWC station on the Tijuana River, we have another logger with a, um, with a sound housing, and that's uh, Pablo Bryan installing it there. Unfortunately, the site uh, is either stagnant or it ends up being dry a lot of the time. So it's been one of our monitoring challenges. So we are now getting you know, some real time uh, data on turbidity, conductivity, CDON, tryptophan. And um, this is an example from the January 30th uh, storm event showing spikes in turbidity, drops in conductivity, um, and initial drops in tryptophan and CDOM followed by increases during those uh, subsequent uh, sewage flows after the storm. But we don't yet know how those correlate with um, bacteria concentrations. So we uh, did some auto sampler deployments. And this is an example of one of them. This is the, the black is uh, the discharge of the Tijuana River uh, showing uh, two, two peaks during a, an, an event in December. And uh, the corresponding time series of, I forgot where my marker is, uh, time series of uh, tryptophan in orange and turbidity in red. And um, there were um, increases in tryptophan like fluorescence on the uh, sort of post storm sewage release period, um, which we might have expected, but also a few interesting outliers. Um, and what we were sort of surprised by was uh, dilution of the bacteria during uh, some of the peak parts of the storm event. So we wanted to see if we could capture that with our uh, with our sensor. But we noted that some of those hot, anomalously high bacteria concentrations were associated with low tryptophan-like fluorescence. Um, so we realized um, that we need to do a turbidity correction factor. Uh, so turbidity has a big, a strong impact on on tryptophan. So, we implemented a trip, uh, tryptophan correction. That's simple exponential correction, and that changes the orange curve into a green curve. And um, and it turns out that that lines up pretty well with those uh, with those spikes. So, with the corrected uh, turbidity corrected tryptophan values, we we see decent, if not perfect, correlations uh, between. Uh, between the tryptophan and, and bacteria concentrations. But um, we're noting that K may not be constant over space and time. This uh, this um, turbidity correction that we're having to do may or may, or may not be constant over space and time and among sensors. So that's, that's uh, complicating the situation. So down in the Boca Rio site, instead of showing the discharge, um, this is for an earlier event there, and there were storm events here. Uh, I'm showing the conductivity and the water level in the estuary. And so just like uh, Luke presented, 
uh, it's really on the sort of incoming, where's my, where's my laser pointer? There it is. Um, so it's really on sort of the um, transitional going from low to high tide that we see incursions of um, fresh water and sewage uh, coming into this tidal branch of the estuary with uh, peaks in, in turbidity, as well as peaks in bacteria and peaks in the corrected uh, turbidity corrected tryptophan values. So once again, they, the, the tryptophan um, spikes correspond pretty well with, with the bacteria. There's a little bit of temporal offset perhaps. Uh, so similar situation, we have a pretty good, if not perfect correlation, and we're playing around with how to um, relate the sond measurements to the bacteria uh, uh, concentrations. So um, we take those same samples back to the lab and measure them in with a fancier instrument called an aqualog. And its tryptophan-like fluorescence correlates almost perfectly with E. coli. So we're pretty sure that the, the tryptophan fluorescence is a pretty good indicator of, um, of E. coli and that we have to figure out how to, um, how to further correct our field measured tryptophan values to account for turbulence, perhaps particle size. Um, uh, it is, it's interfering here. Um, so one big challenge, these instruments take a fair amount of time to maintain. They get buried in sediment uh, during the first events of the season. They require somewhat frequent maintenance. Uh, so they're, they're a little bit temperamental. And so we, you kind of have to, to, it takes a fair amount of, of uh, personnel, staff time, as well as sustained funding to sort of move forward and maintain. So we're complementing this with uh, some remote sensing. Um, and we've implemented a Google Earth Engine script to use Sentinel. Um, and the Sentinel overpasses are pretty frequent. Unfortunately, a lot of them don't really occur, as you might predict, that don't necessarily coincide with the high turbidity values. Um, and the, of course, the imagery is not available when it's cloudy. Um, but for the days that we do have good image uh, imagery, we have a pretty good correlation between turbidity and, and in situ uh, turbidity values. And um, using those maps, we can identify some hot spots of where turbidity is occurring, but we really need to validate these. Um, it's difficult, however, to validate using uh, kayaks because uh, we tend to try to avoid hum uh, human exposure and kayak contact with the water after storm releases when sewage uh, is present. And so we're working with a, with a local uh, uh, model, uh, model boat community to, to devise an RC boat system that can cruise around and, and map turbidity after storm events. Um, so our long-term goals are to um, have this develop into a real-time uh, water quality warning system. We do it for air pollution, why not for water? Um, we need to figure out where the funding source and who would be implementing that kind of system. And we feel like there's real possibility for the hyperspectral ground-based ground cameras to provide um, real-time information that's not as subject to biofouling and sensor uh, issues uh, that we've been noticing in the estuary in particular. Um, so we want to also use these data to map, map hotspots and hot moments of pollution, um, as well as in the longer term, establish the sediment bacteria budget of the estuary, in particular, how much pollution does sediment and, and uh, pollution does the estuary uh, retain. And we have a start on this. Um, I collaborated with some folks uh, with Christine Taniguchi from SCORP to quantify the decadal patterns in runoff and sediment loads in the in the Tijuana River. So we've we're getting pretty close to nailing the um, the sediment load uh, contribution. We'd also like to nail the uh, bacteria load contribution. And the biggest challenge here is instrumenting the mouth um, of the estuary. And um, so we're really interested in trying to uh, do that on our. Um, open suggestions on, on how one might do that in a logistically feasible and uh, way that's safe for instrumentation. Um, so um, thanks very much. So there's a couple of different websites that you can go to to check out um, the results from this work, uh, as well as uh, from the hyperspectral 
imagery, uh, more general information site for that. And with that, I will stop and hand it over to Sarah. So thanks, everybody. Thank you, Trent, very much. Sarah, looking forward to hearing from you. We'll be hearing from Sarah with the Sarah Giddings with the Scripps Institution of Oceanography um, on her work, how do estuarine outflows interact with surf zone breaking waves and spread in the coastal zone? Pass it to you, Sarah. Great. All right. Um, let me pull this up. Um, thank you so much. Uh, Kristen and Laura for all of your organizational efforts in this um, symposium. It's been really great so far. Um, Trent, the issue of deploying things directly in the mouth is something I can definitely relate to, um, which we can talk about later. Um, so this is a great follow-up to what Trent was just discussing. Um, and this is looking at what comes out of the estuaries. So um, this, work is really focused on the physics of what comes out of the estuaries and how that spreads in the coastal ocean. Um, a lot of the work I'm gonna be presenting today was funded by NSF and um, North, Amer North American Development Bank through the EPA, as well as USCRP, um, but there's overlap with some work that's funded by state parks. And we had a lot of logistical support for a recent experiment from state parks and National Estuarine Research Reserve. Um, and we've done some model validation work um, using California state parks funded observations as well as uh, Navy. Um, there's a lot of different collaborators on this because I'm gonna present work that spans uh, almost 10 years of work here, so. Um, why do we care about how estuaries and rivers interact with the coast? Um, they're the main mechanism for delivery of pterogenous material to the coastal ocean. So that includes sediment and pollutants like Trent was just talking about. Um, it's also, uh, really important for thinking about the two-way exchange. So we're not just thinking about things that go out onto the coast, which is what I'm going to focus on today, but also what comes into estuaries. And so two-way exchange of delivery of nutrients, um, primary productivity, low pH, um, oxygen deplete water, et cetera. So you really have an exchange between estuaries and the coastal ocean that impact the coastal ecosystems, both inside of the estuary as well as on the coast. Um, there's a physics reason to be interested in this, the, these outflows deliver heat and buoyancy to the coastal ocean, which can change uh, the near shore circulation um, and ultimately change transport processes, which might be impacting transport of things like harmful algal blooms, larval connectivity, et cetera. And there's sort of this overarching question of how do these systems respond to a changing climate? Um, of course, our local area, um, there's a lot of interest in the Tijuana River specifically because it is a known point source for pollution uh, as Trent was just showing. Um, but I wanna emphasize that here when I'm thinking about the physics, I'm thinking about not just pollution, but also some of those other things I mentioned on the prior slide, things like nutrient delivery, sediment um, and larvae and how this really impacts coastal economies as, as well as ecosystems. Uh, the work I'm presenting today is really focused on small outflow plumes. So this is a schematic from a review paper by Alex Horner Devine, but there's been a huge amount of research done on large river plumes. So think of like the Columbia River plume and the Mississippi River plume. And we know a lot about those plumes and where they go and how they spread in the coastal ocean and what dominates their spreading. So things like wind and the earth's rotation affect where they go. Um, those larger scale plumes don't typically interact directly with the surf zone. Sometimes that's because of man-made changes where mounts have been channelized. Um, and sometimes that's just because of the scale, the, those large plumes just shoot out of the surf zone and really don't care about the surf zone. These smaller scale plumes like we have throughout California, throughout really many places, uh, Mediterranean climates worldwide, they interact directly with the surf zone. And there's been a lot of work done on surf zone transport. Um, and it's well known that alongshore surf zone cur currents are driven by 
gradients and the wave radiation stress, so essentially wave direction and strength, uh, is what drives uh, the, the, the flow in the surf zone. And it's known that rip currents and eddies play a strong role in transport in that region, as well as bathymetry. Um, this, is, this slide is showing results from an experiment called the Seaside Experiment that was done in 2015. And we did, this is with uh, Falk Federson. We did a die release, let's see, can you guys see my cursor? Yes, no? Yeah, so I can see it. Okay, so we did a die release right about here. This is just a visual snapshot, but we uh, tracked the die with um, an airplane with a hyperspectral camera because the die has a known uh, absorption emission spectrum. And so we can actually quantify the die concentration. And as I click through this, you're gonna see a movie play that shows uh, the die movement from this particular release. This was not involving an outflow. This is just the surf zone. So you see very rapid um, uh, movement in the surf zone and the die spread over 10 kilometers in less than 12 hours. And there's a significant shear. So this in this particular release, the surf zone was going north because waves were coming from the south driving currents to the north in the surf zone. However, the inner shelf, which is in this case, wind and pressure gradient driven was going towards the south. And so you actually had a strong shear where dye, dye that was trapped in the surf zone goes north and anything ejected offshore goes south. So this really impacts the overall spreading of that uh, plume of dye. Um, for that 2015 experiment, we did three different releases, and those are summarized in these maps, which show the maximum concentration observed. Um, and the star indicates where they were released from. <clears throat> uh, and um, we did do one release in the estuary mouth of the Tijuana. However, there was not a buoyancy outflow. So there wasn't any freshwater input at the time. It was just the outflow from the tides. Um, but you can see drastically different spreading and ultimate fate of these three different releases. And that depended on where the release happened and uh, the winds and the waves, wave conditions. This figure is part of something that's in a paper by uh, Matt Pendergraft, who is a student working on actually the air side of this. And so we were able to track the dye, <clears throat> not only in the water, but also in the air and showing a direct link between stuff that can get in the water can also get into the air. And there's been follow-up work on that in terms of looking at air quality um, in this region. So the question is, all right, so we know what happens in the surf zone pretty well. We can see from that 2015 that there is quite a bit of variability depending upon the conditions. What happens if we add an estuary with, an, with a buoyant outflow, freshwater outflow? Um, so there's sort of, in the absence of complex wave conditions, we might expect a, a fairly symmetrical plume that you can see here. Um, but we know that there's competition with waves. And so ultimately, we might expect the plume to either be trapped in the surf zone or eject offshore or something in between the two. And as a plume travels along shore, it might experience offshore ejection via rip currents, be impacted by tides and be impacted by bathymetry. There's a lot of things that can change the ultimate sort of fate of a, of a small plume that directly interacts with the surf zone because of the waves and the strength and momentum that the waves impart. So that includes both their mixing and um, the alongshore currents that they drive. So uh, we did some idealized modeling work where we looked at this question. We said, okay, let's take a outflow plume and some normally incident waves and put them into a numerical modeling framework. And this is going to be a video where the left-hand side is a plume in the absence of waves and the right-hand side is a plume with waves. This is very idealized. There's not an effective earth rotation. There's no wind. It's just 
the plume on the left hand side with the background hydrodynamics and then plume with waves on the right hand side. Um, the top is showing sea surface height and wave height. The middle is showing the top down plan view of the plume. And then these are the cross sections. And so you can see that this plume in this idealized situation, no tides or anything, reaches this sort of uh, steady state solution. Um, and that's summarized in this slide here. So the plume sp spreads radially. Um, and when there's no waves, there's not really any trapping close to shore. It just spreads offshore radially. Um, and in the cross section view, you can see that it forms a thin upper layer of fresh water as it moves offshore. As you increase the waves, you get more and more of the plume that's actually trapped in the coast, uh, in, the, in the surf zone, and it spreads along shore. And as you can imagine, this would have pretty dramatic impacts on exposure to, for example, pollutants, as well as things like um, larval connectivity and thinking about where larvae spread, as well as sediment. Um, so this question of whether a plume is trapped due to strong waves or weak outflow, or whether it can escape offshore um, in the condition where there's weaker waves or a much stronger outflow is, is a really important question to understand if you want to understand the fate of these plumes. Um, there's been other work that has worked on this. There was a paper by Wong et al. And then there's this paper by Kastner et al. Um, where people have done field observations of, of wave plume interactions and shown in both the Wong paper as well as this Kastner paper that in most conditions, the river water was indeed trapped inside of the surf zone. This, this slide shows sort of a conceptual model of, of when you might expect trapping versus escapes, um, which is something that we're continuing to work on is essentially, we're seeing this trapping occurring frequently. We sometimes see escapes. We wanna be able to predict when you're going to see which of those scenarios, because that will help you predict water quality at the coastline along beaches, as well as sediment delivery. Um, so as part of this work, we've been doing some realistic ocean modeling, um, and I can get into the model in more detail if anyone has any questions, but it has realistic forcing. So unlike the idealized, we now have realistic offshore ocean conditions, atmospheric forcing, winds, tides, waves, et cetera. Um, and it's three-dimensional. And we also put in a passive dye tracer for the two known major point sources in this domain, which is the Tijuana River, um, which comes in based on river flow, and then the outflow at Punta Vendetta, which is sort of a continuous um, inflow. Um, and this is just a a movie showing results from that model over a, a specific time period. Um, wave height and direction with the magnitude of the waves are on the left panel, then surface temperature and water velocity at the surface, surface salinity, and then the surface concentration of dye that is coming out of the Tijuana River and the con surface concentration of dye coming from Punta Bandera. And importantly, when we switch to right now, when we get a strong wave event coming from the south, you can see things getting trapped and traveling quickly up the coast. This is consistent with what we saw when we did our actual dye releases, but now these plumes have buoyancy in them. Um, and we've done a lot of work uh, to try to understand these plumes and how they spread to try to think specifically about predicting water quality in this particular region. Um, and again, we're, we're looking at the Tijuana River point source as well as the Punta Mandera point source. And um, for looking at beaches to the north of Punta Mandera, um, the, the important season is the summer season because that's when the swell is usually from the south, which drives currents to the north. And that's also when people are most heavily uh, recreating at the beaches. Um, so we actually took our physics model and incorporated it with a uh, model to represent a particular uh, pollutant, which is norovirus, 
um, which is plentiful in raw sewage and actually dominates swimmer illness risk, even though it's not something that's typically tested for in beach water sampling, it causes um, GI issues mostly. Um, and then we turned that into a probability for illness. So based on the number of swimmers and your exposure, um, we take the dye and, and convert it into a concentration of norovirus and then have a probability of getting sick from that exposure. And so uh, this is information from Imperial Beach here in terms of number of swimmers yearly, um, which peaks in the tourist season and the summertime, and then sort of an estimate of uh, the probability that you might get sick um, from swimming at the beaches, which increases um, during that summer season. And again, that has to do with two factors. One is the fact that there are more people swimming there during that time, but also because during that time is when you get the waves from the south driving flow to the north from these point sources. Um, we were asked to do a very specific analysis of some different scenarios that um, the United States and Mexico uh, agreements are trying to get at in terms of decision making. So we have the baseline, which is how things are operating now, um, a scenario that diverts the Tijuana flow up to a certain amount, um, and also uh, at the same time reduces the flow coming out of Punta Bandera. Um, scenario B that only diverts the Tijuana flow and scenario C that diverts even more of the Tijuana flow. And ultimately, um, the scenario that leads to the largest reduction in beach closure events in this particular region is scenario A, which is because it reduces the point source of Punta Bandera because that point source is coming in continuously and versus the Tijuana only comes in when there is a rainfall event. And so you don't have a high risk from the Tijuana during that summer season when the waves are going to the north um, and when people are swimming at the beach. And so you get um, significant reductions in the time, this is the fraction of time that beaches are impacted above a certain contaminant threshold level determined by the EPA. Um, so you get a significant reduction um, in the fraction of time that's impacted uh, in that scenario. Um, we've taken this further with a USCRP grant um, to look at how can we model this more effectively? So the 3D heteronymic model is really the way we wanna go, but it's computationally expensive and it's expensive to try to get that up and running into a real-time model, although that's still our goal. Um, but we wanted to see how well we could do with the 1D model, which is significantly simpler to do computationally. And overall, a simple 1D wave-driven model performs pretty well. The comparison in this case is not with observational data of water quality at the beaches, but just comparing to the 3D hydrodynamic model. Um, and essentially, this is a, a binary comparison. So basically looking at that water quality cutoff and looking at when you might trigger a beach advisory, how many true negatives, true positives, false positives, and false negatives that you get. And so as you move north. So we've got Punta, um, Playa's Tijuana is the first beach here, then the Tijuana River estuary mouth in the dashed green, Imperial Beach, um, Silver Strand, and Hotel del Coronado. And the presence of dye above this cutoff, so uh, matches at 90% of all time steps in all of the locations. And so we're, we're seeing that we can do decently well with a 1D model, although again, ultimately, we're still interested in and having an actual real-time 3D model running. Um, so a, a lot of what I just showed, so I showed sort of the background on what we know about the nearshore transport. And then I showed um, idealized simulations that bring into this a river plume, and as well as some field results that suggest that river plumes can be trapped inside of the surf zone and therefore be subject to the longshore transport via surf zone currents. And then I showed specific results um, for the Tijuana region. 
this is not just an issue at the Tijuana. It's it's a very um, strong issue in the Tijuana because of the large quantity of uh, pollutants that come in there. But we really want to know this question for lots of small estuaries around the world that might be outputting not just pollutants, but things like sediment and larvae and, and other parameters of interest. And so we have an NSF project that we just finished last week. Um, and so this is very preliminary results, but essentially what we did is we did uh, some dye releases in the mouth of Los Penisquitos Lagoon. And the reason for choosing that location was because of the water quality issues that are in Tijuana. So as um, Trent is doing with his team of folks, you know, we have to be careful and avoid um, uh, health impacts for our team of folks as well. And so we did these releases at the mouth of Los Penasquitos Lagoon. Los Penasquitos is also a nice location to do this because the coastline is relatively straight. And so it gives us sort of a back background understanding of how these plumes spread in the coastal ocean. Um, and these are really preliminary results. Like I said, the last release finished um, Thursday of last week. So these are imagery from a drone. Um, and we had out there, I should mention, we're measuring the dye concentration with a bunch of in situ instrumentation, fluorometers, as well as a jet ski that has fluorometers strapped to it, as well as salinity sensors. Um, and in this case, we're not using an airplane, but a hyperspectral camera mounted to a specialty drone and then visual drone imaging like you see here. And so um, we have, uh, we did three different releases and we released half the dye early on in the ebb tide and then the other half later at a lower water level. And five out of the six of those partial releases, the dye was trapped in the surf zone and spread along shore. Four of them, it actually spread in both directions. It went both north and south. Those days had smaller waves that were normally incident. Um, this first release had larger waves and the plume was driven towards the south because of the dominant wave conditions. And then one of the six releases, we got a plume escape where the plume punched through the surf zone and expanded offshore. Um, and so we're just digging into these results. Um, and this is just, I just threw this in there because Trent was talking about what we can do with, oops, sorry, um, satellite imagery. So this is a satellite image um, that uh, shows the plume because there was a large river flow event a uh, couple days prior. So you can see the outline of the plume, sediment plume, and then you can actually see the pink dye in here as well. Um, and so we're spending a lot of time thinking about the, the fate right along the beaches close to the mouth. We're also interested in the larger scale um, fate of these plumes for, for questions of, of sediment transport and ecosystem impacts. Um, so big picture summary, um, waves dominate surf zone transport. And both measurements and models show that small outflow plumes are really impacted by those waves, the wave breaking in the surf zone, and are often trapped in the surf zone and spread along shore. Um, you can get offshore ejection under certain conditions, and we're trying to get a range of conditions so we can better predict that. We also had offshore ejection via rip currents, um, and it appears from our most recent releases that mouth bathymetry seems to play a really critical role in the ultimate fate of these plumes. And so that's something that we'll be looking at more and ties back to the talks that you heard earlier on both estuary mouth and adjacent beach morphology. Um, specific to the US-Mexico border region, um, it's heavily influenced by outflow from Punta Bandera because of the summertime south swells um, and lack of rain. Um, the And that we have a 1D wave model that can do a decent job predicting um, shoreline concentrations. There's several different websites that I've put up here that focus on each of these projects. So the Seaside Experiment was the die releases done in 2015 at Imperial Beach in the surf zone. The um, 
NADB 2017 is really looking at the results from um, these questions of different scenarios for the US-Mexico region. Um, we have some movies that you can find for the USCRP project on the third link. And then the last one is our most recent experiment. Um, and lots of thank yous. Um, <laughs> Like I said, this is a variety of work over many years, and so there's a lot of different funding agencies. We also had a lot of support from folks in uh, California State Parks, as well as National Extreme Research Reserve. Um, so really a lot of different moving parts all coming together here. Thanks. Thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you, Trent. I think we have time for maybe one or a couple questions. Laura, I'll pass it to you to see if there's anything in the queue. Yeah, there's one in the queue. In terms of the warning system, we're talking to try and um, just question about curious if the water pollutants data could be made publicly accessible, especially in some sort of mapping form so that the public can better understand the impacts of extreme weather events or possibly predict these future events. And I imagine your partnership with SCORP is definitely geared towards something along those lines. Yeah, that's right. I mean, so right now we have, um, well, anybody who is interested in having access to the real-time data um, can get that uh, by contacting me directly, um, but we are moving towards a publicly distributing the data. We're a little bit, um, we're also mindful that we need to make sure that the data are, are QAQC'd um, prior to, to public we're along with public distribution. So we're working on, we're thinking about how to do that in a way that's responsible so that we don't, aren't posting data that would be um, setting off alerts and alarm bells where there isn't a problem. Um, so, um, but yeah, that's that's the long-term goal is to set up a, a public facing website. And we have a mock-up, but the links break, and, you know, you kind of need a, you need a real time uh, sort of, um, constant up, uh, uh, sort of website uh, health maintenance person <laughs> to make sure the website continues to survive and limp along. So um, yeah, that is, thank you for that question. And that's definitely where we're headed. Um, so I'm actually going to go ahead and just put up the next um, mentee question because I think it's a good one as well. Um, whoops. Thank you, Laura. Yeah. And I'll just I'll just point out, um, Sarah, Jeff Crooks has a question in the chat, maybe you'd be able to help answer while we get our Menti up. Um, and for those of you who haven't been participating in Menti or just joined us, you can use your phone or a web browser and use this code up above to answer a question that Trent actually, I think, might have posed for the group. What's important to know about dry and wet weather conditions for estuary management and health? Um, you wanted me to answer Jeff's question in yeah. the I think we have the time for that, Sarah, while folks are populating Menti, sure. Um, yeah, so Jeff asked, um, he said, understanding the Punta Bandera role in the border region is critical and using norovirus is valuable, but is there work to try to relate it to fecal indicator bacteria? So that's our ultimate goal is we're trying to you know, like we did this model that related the dye concentration to um, norovirus, we're trying to do the same thing for other bacteria, including fecal indicator bacteria, so that we can do comparisons with um, each water quality sampling that's been done. Um, and this is sort of ongoing work. Um, it takes a lot to do this because a lot of different bacteria have different decay rates, some decay relative to sunlight, Etc. So there's a lot that goes into this, but that's um, something we'd like to do. Great, thanks Great. for addressing that, Sarah. And I'm seeing some responses come in to your question, Trent. Different ecosystem needs and services, um, duration and volume of rain events, changes in sedimentation and erosion, erosion with climate change. The first rains that breach the river mouths mean bacteria in our surf zone don't surf until it's clean. The frequency of coincidence of wet weather events and high wave events and how that would affect estuarine water quality and community health. 
great contributions. Thank you all so much. I think we're going to move into our next session. Um, it, it's on coastal wetland and dune habitats and drivers of change and approaches toward restoration. So we'll be hearing from my colleague at the Tijuana River National Estuarine Research Reserve, Kelly Ueda, who will be presenting on monitoring habitat change in the Tijuana Estuary, followed by Dave Hubbard with Coastal Restoration Consultants. Dave will be presenting on coastal dunes at Borderfield State Park, a dynamic ecosystem on the edges. So we'll start with Kelly, if uh, Kelly's here, or maybe it will be Jeff. Oh, Laura might be uh, inviting Kelly to our to our panelist set here. There she is. Take it away, Kelly, whenever you have, have a moment to share your screen. All right, I think I'm finally uh, unmuted and sharing my screen here. Sorry, I'm getting over a cold, so I'm a little uh, hoarse here, but I'll I'll do my best. All right, so my talk today is on monitoring habitat change in the Tijuana Estuary. And I just wanna say also that I'm so uh, delighted to be here, so delighted to be part of this symposium with all these other great speakers. I really enjoyed uh, hearing everyone's talks uh, so far today. All right, so I'm gonna cover two main areas of habitat change. One is this core scale uh, informed by aerial photography, uh, uh, change near the river mouth, uh, and the other is this very fine scale field based uh, vegetation monitoring. So two uh, very different ways of looking at vegetation change in the marsh. All right, so we've already heard a fair amount about, or maybe not a fair amount, we've, we've heard uh, at least briefly earlier today about mouth position. And so uh, we've already seen that uh, the position of the mouth has been changing through time. Uh, most recently, and this uh, image at the end here is from 2023, from uh, just from last month in January. Uh, and we can see that the mouth is rather uh, south of the, the main channel. And this started somewhere around 2009. Uh, prior to this, and in 2005, and in this earliest image we have, and 1928, uh, the mouth inlet was right around uh, this main channel. Um, and it's only been in, in recent years that it's been moving south. Um, and so my uh, colleague, uh, Monica, mapped all the locations, all the known locations based on all the aerial photography, historic aerial photography, and satellite imagery that she could get her hands on. Uh, and these are all the positions of the mouth from 1928 uh, until 2017. And the main thing to note here is that this most recent time period from about you know, 2010 on uh, is when the mouth has moved uh, decidedly south. Now, this, uh, we, so we've known about this you know, migration of the mouth, uh, but I personally didn't really think much about it other than that the mouth was changed and that we, you know, we had issues with a, a mouth closure. Um, but I didn't realize until I went out in the field that, oh, chunks of marsh are missing. There's, uh, you know, there's clear evidence of high erosion, you know, just large chunks uh, of the marsh that were missing uh, due to erosion in this area. I took pictures from the edge here and, you know, looked at the geotagging and you know I was many many meters from where the uh, aerial imagery had showed where the edge of the marsh was uh, and so we set out to map this um, this is a video from a story map that uh, I worked on with my colleagues and this will be uh, up on our website soon uh, but this is just an animation of the change through time this is mapped with uh, near map, mostly near map imagery, uh, some uh, nape imagery as well. Um, but I'll I'll get this started to play for us. Um, so you can see over fairly short time scales. This is just starting in 2014. So just over the past uh, eight years, uh, substantial change occurring, and there is like I had noticed in the field. 
uh, this substantial erosion happening uh, in the southern. I didn't mean to play it a second time in case uh, now we can just uh, enjoy it, but I'll, I'll move on to uh, what I intended to show, which was the overall change. Uh, so these areas of darker green uh, is where marsh was gained, and this orange is the marsh lost. So I had, you know, seen with some uh, horror of the large, uh, large chunks of the marsh missing, but I didn't realize until I did this analysis is this is actually more than compensated for uh, by the marsh gain to the north. So the net change in this time period from 2014 to 2022 uh, was actually almost a, he a hectare of increase in marsh. So we saw this accretion uh, in areas that were formerly mudflats uh, and it increased to the level that uh, salt marsh plants were able to uh, get established and uh, take over these areas and, and stabilize this part of the, uh, the marsh. Um, and then, you know, of course, this area of marsh loss is then associated with the southern migration of the mouth and the erosion that occurs as the uh, water kind of moves along, uh, you know, rapidly makes that turn to, to exit the estuary. All right, so changing gears uh, completely, this is on to the fine scale analysis part. Um, so I'm, I'm interested in particular in these transition zones or ecotones. I like this picture because it shows really clearly this change from the uh, invaded uh, upland area with all this chrysanthemum and grasses uh, moving down into the marsh. And once you get this influence of the saltwater, you know, saltwater inundation, uh, all of these uh, non-native species drop out. And so the way that we had historically uh, placed our uh, vegetation transects, uh, you know, well, well before my time, uh, Dr. Joy Zedler's time, was within a single habitat, so low or a single zone, so a low marsh, mid marsh, and high marsh zone. The, the transects were contained entirely within uh, those zones, but we've realized that it's important to also have transects that go across zones, that go from this higher elevation down to the lower elevation to get us a better a, a better idea of what's happening as we continue to see sea level rise. And so here are three of our vegetation transects and the area so you can see the you know sea of PVC we have very clearly defined boundaries the corners of the quadrats are marked with these uh, permanent uh, PVC markers so we can be sure that we're putting our quadrats in the exact same location year after year um, and the area in particular I'm going to focus on for this next slide is this zone here this transition zone between Falcornia pacifica the pickleweed and uh, Spartina foliosa, the cord grass. Uh, and so I'm just gonna focus on uh, what happened in the, that particular zone in that quadrat, you know, this unchanging uh, quadrat that is in that zone. And so that's what we have here. Um, so my colleagues uh, started placing, uh, you know, transects going across uh, the zones in 2012. Uh, and so that's when this uh, data set starts. Uh, in green, we have the Salicornia pacifica, a little uh, visual there of what the, the pickle weed looks like. Uh, and in blue is the Spartina foliosa, this lower marsh species, uh, the cord grass. And at the start of our monitoring period, when we placed these transects or these quadrats, we essentially had no Spartina in this particular area. So it was a, you know, this transition between pickleweed and cordgrass, uh, but it was uh, dominated by uh, Salicornia, the, the pickleweed. Uh, as we moved through time, we saw this uh, dramatic decline in Salicornia and an increase in Spartina. It goes from 0% cover to 50% cover in 2017. So very, uh, very dramatic increase. 
Uh, and then it declines again, and it's you know back now to a fairly low level of cover. Um, and the uh, some of you I'm sure have already uh, imagined for yourself what a, a possible cause of this could be. I have uh, on top uh, here is the mean sea level uh, for San Diego, uh, and showing this increase in sea level uh, corresponding with the El Nino event. Um, and, and this is the time period uh, in which we see this uh, you know, reversal, this moving of Spartina. This Spartina is moving uh, higher and dominating areas previously dominated by uh, Salicornia. And then when it returns to uh, a more typical sea level, uh, then this pattern reverses. And so this is, Fascinating uh, for on many levels, you know, it's it's great to have uh, this annual monitoring. You can see if we had only monitored uh, every five years, uh, we would have missed this entirely. Uh, if we, you know, even um, skipping every other year, we might have missed the, uh, the you know, strong, uh, strongest part of this pattern. So it's great, uh, great that we have this annual monitoring uh, at this very fine scale. Uh, and I, I meant to say earlier, as you can see there, that um, my boss, Dr. Jeff Crooks, uh, is the one who put this figure together and noticed this uh, pattern initially and, you know, really uh, drew it out. So it's, it's great to have this annual monitoring to kind of give us a preview of uh, what's to come with sea level rise. Um, and yeah, just in, in review, the marsh uh, near the mouth is highly dynamic, you know, more dynamic than we expected, uh, both in terms of marsh gain and loss on these very short time scales. Uh, and also this annual vegetation monitoring like we just saw provides a really helpful preview of future changes to come associated with sea level rise. Uh, and I just want to say uh, thanks to the Pitora and the Navy uh, for funding this work, uh, in particular, the uh, marsh change in the mouth as part of the project detecting habitat change. And thank to, thanks to all of you for um, your attention and for having me. Thanks so much, Kelly, for joining us, especially feeling under the weather. We really appreciate it. Uh, our next and final presenter, Dave Hubbard. We're excited to have you. Um, we'll be presenting Coastal Dunes at Border Field State Park, a dynamic ecosystem on the edges. Thanks, Dave. Dave, you might be on mute. <laughs> Thanks, Kristen. Can you see my presentation? I can see your presentation and hear you. Thanks so much. Great. Thank you. Um, well, <laughs> thank you for the invitation to, to join in the symposium today. And um, I really enjoyed a lot of the talks. I think uh, the talks that had the closest intersection with what I'm going to talk about were Adam's and uh, Kelly's on the habitat change. Um, uh, I'm going to give credit to my co-author, Matt James, who's also with Coastal Restoration Consultants. Um, there are a lot of acknowledgments I should make. And in particular, I wanna uh, point out Hani Alwani, Federico Scarelli, and James Peeler, who did this work with us uh, at Borderfields. Uh, the presentation today, I'm gonna talk briefly about coastal dunes dive into some historical ecology, and then talk a little bit about um, experimental work we've done with dune restoration at the site. Uh, let's see, dunes. Dunes are really cool because um, the, the interaction of plants with sand and wind creates uh, cool landforms. Uh, this is a hummock with a, a Bronia meridima on it. That's a red sand verbena. And what you see here is a, probably a few years of sand accumulation where wind laden, sand laden wind has been blowing across the landscape. It's hit the plant and dropped out. The plant gets buried and then in response, the plant grows back up. 
And it repeats the cycle many, many times and it creates these sorts of landforms. Um, if you get enough uh, dune hummocks in a place and let them grow for long enough, they have an opportunity to form this really cool uh, geomorphic feature, which is the um, four dune, which is unique to coastal environments. This is a typical Southern California four dune ridge with a few species uh, trapping and uh, trapping sand. Out in front, you see embryonic dunes. These are where um, plants are recruiting and forming hummocks. And they can, this could possibly form a new dune ridge and intercept the sand that's going to the bigger ridge here. But um, a lot of times we get these uh, big wave disturbance events that interrupt the cycle. Um, so that's how dunes accrete and dunes do a lot of eroding too. This is from January up on our stretch of coast. This is a typical response of dunes to a wave disturbance event. It's a scarping, the formation of a cliff that erodes back into the dune. And uh, it's one of, uh, it, when the waves are in collision with the landform, this is what it usually looks like. Um, a second thing that's really important in, in these uh, large wave events um, are breaching of the dunes and overwash, where the water is no longer hitting the dunes, it cuts through. This is Devereaux Lagoon and Coal Oil Point Reserve in January with um, two new breaches formed as well as the main mouth opening. So there were three things going on during this period and the way the Fording Ridge acts as a barrier um, uh, really changed. Um, typically, uh, I think of the highest annual wave run up as hitting right about at the dune toe in most of our Southern California systems. The stuff seaward of that is a young and more ephemeral habitat. And then I put another dotted line here along the back of the habitat. That is effectively the 10 year wave run up line. And um, we, we, we saw this whole system taken out in the last month. and uh, it will take many years for it to come back. So this is a really interesting, dynamic, uh, ephemeral habitat. Um, we got to do work down at uh, Borderfield State Park um, for a few years through the pandemic. And the yellow arrow here indicates where we did the work. It's about a kilometer of shoreline. Uh, it used to, well, much of the area probably used to look something like this with mature dunes, um, not forming a solid four dune ridge, but a, a gappy ridge with a lot of sand blowing inland through the system. Um, I have some old topo maps here, the 1904 and the 1930 on the right. And this shows on the right an area where the Navy constructed a bunch of large mounds associated with some sort of uh, shooting range. Um, but if you look at the, where the arrows are pointing, you can also see little polygons uh, with topo lines around them indicating um, what looks like the 25 foot contour. So the dunes were probably quite large in, in, in the stretch when they did this mapping. Um, I should mention the uh, excellent report by San Francisco Estuary S Institute on the um, historical ecology of the river valley, including the dunes. This figure is from their report, and um, it shows the existence of a four dune ridge back here in, I think this is 1919. Uh, yeah, 1919. Um, Inland of the Four Dune Ridge is an expanse of flat sand, which is not beach. This is a uh, dune slack and sand flats. And then here's another dune ridge, older and much more stabilized, not active like the, the, the oceanward ridge. Um, here's a picture from Monument uh, Mesa a hundred years later, and I'll toggle back and forth between these slides to look at the contrast. Here, here's the modern 
there's the the hundred year old one. You can see the four dune ridge on the left. Present here in 1919 is largely gone. There's sort of um, a scattered bunch of dune forms further inland now, and um, the rest of the landscape going back into wetland habitat looks generally similar. So a lot of change here. And um, the nature of the barrier system, the Fordine Ridge uh, in large wave events has really, has really changed. This figure shows um, an aerial photograph and um, it has two polygons on it. The photograph is from 1928. The yellow polygon has first um, sort of a high tide line indicated here, and then the back of it is uh, the back dune edge where it goes into either wetland habitat or upland habitat on the back. The pink line shows the same thing, the sort of high tide line and then the back of the dunes in 2018. And so you can see that the whole system has moved inland. This is an interesting uh, analog for what sea level rise is going to be doing more into the future. And um, I think this is probably mostly due to um, a negative sand budget in the, in the littoral cell, but uh, I don't have the numbers for that, but I, I believe that's a strong reason for this retreat. And the dunes have rolled and moved inland. Uh, they have rolled over wetland habitat. So this is an important component of um, habitat type conversion in the, in the estuary system. And at the same time, you can see that the yellow polygon is much wider, much deeper here on the order of 150 or 200 meters than the pink polygon, which is the current condition at the site. So we've lost um, wetland habitat and we've lost dune habitat as the system has come back. And there's probably been interesting changes in beach also. Uh, so 100 meter retreat, about one meter per year in the last 100 years, and about 40 hectares of wetland converted to dunes during this retreat. Um, this is image is meant to sort of convey what can happen in a big event. This is the 2015-16 El Nino. And on the left, it's uh, 15 in April, I think. And on the one on the right is, is March of 2016. There's a yellow line uh, drawn in both images in the same location to indicate sort of the leading edge of dense vegetation. There's more dune out on the left. Um, and then I put a blue line in the, and some arrows on the right-hand panel to show areas where a lot of sand had accreted during this one year uh, spanning the El Nino event. Uh, a lot of the sand probably moved by overwash through the dune system. And uh, in addition, undoubtedly, there was windblown sand too. But you can see that it landed on top of areas that had previously had sand um, accretion events that had started to revegetate and then here the cycle starts again and more sand is pushed in toward the wetland, filling it up and making it um, less intertidal or non-intertidal eventually. This is how the dune system will roll into the marsh with, with sea level rise also. The current situation uh, at the site uh, looks like this, very low um, dune mounds, th uh, three, four, five feet tall in patches with um, gaps in between. Uh, there's a lack of a distinct four dune ridge, very low dunes. And then uh, in this one kilometer stretch, there are probably six of these overwash channels where big wave events push over the beach berm and push water through these channels. It transports both the salt water and a sediment it picks up back into the wetland. So it ends up over here. Um, let's see. 
these are profiles through the berm. I apologize for these. Um, the, they're reversed from the aerial image on the right uh, in the profile images. The ocean is on the right here and inland is on the left. So it's, it's, it's a little tricky, but um, you can see the characteristic profiles have a very steep beach face, a beach berm, a back slope on the beach, and then a small area of dunes perched on the back. Uh, this falls away into wetland habitat further back. Um, we did a lot of vegetation monitoring on the site, and uh, this is the results in the northern stretch, which shows several um, plant species ex expressed in percent cover over distance from inland toward the beach. And you can see here that the red sand verbena here in red is the dominant plant form in the outer part of the vegetation, the seaward part of the vegetation. This corresponds with where the four dunes are because it is at this site, red sand verbena is the plant that is building the, the dunes. Uh, in contrast, there's the green here. This is uh, salt grass, which is a wetland species. And um, it, it peaks much further back. So here we have the transition between dune and wetland um, on the transect. And we have uh, other species that are not quite so strongly zoned and span the whole stretch. In front of that, out here where this oval is, uh, it's unvegetated. And I suspect that this would be the area where Fordune would naturally be, but there's been a lot of pressure on the system as it's been retreating uh, rapidly. And it also had a lot of pressure from off-road vehicles. Uh, we did a couple of things out there on the site to do uh, restoration and to learn about doing restoration on the site. We collected uh, 30 kilograms of native plant fruits and redistributed them on the site in experimental plots. And um, we found that in the seeded plots, we got native seedlings. And in the non-seeded plots, we did not get seedlings. So the seed bank at this point in that very area was uh, pretty much free of native dune species. We also installed wooden shims in arrays to try and trap sand in unvegetated areas uh, to build up topography. And um, we had interesting results with them. This is one installed in one of those washover channels. And you can see that the blowing sand has completely buried the array. And um, we put them out also in the experimental plots in different configurations. Um, and I, this was my favorite configuration because uh, the, the hummocks we got out of it looked remarkably similar to the hummocks of the native vegetation. The trick here will be to figure out how to incorporate um, adding plants to the system so that it can have resilience over time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dave, Kelly. Um, I don't know, Laura, if we have any questions in queue for the Q&A segment, but I'll hand it over to you in case there are. Uh, I don't see any in here, although I just think that it would be really interesting to know from a monitoring perspective, since we've heard a lot about sort of event-based monitoring today, as well as the sort of longer-term monitoring, um, both for both for both of you guys, because you're really looking at habitat change. You know, what do you think some, what are some key elements that you think in terms of sort of testing monitoring strategies are really important for us to sort of continue to understand this habitat change going forward? Um, I'll jump in and just say that um, I think annual monitoring of the system would yield a lot of really interesting high quality information, and then it would be able to capture the baseline, the impacts and the recovery curves in, in the vegetation and the topography. Yeah, 
Yeah, I'll just chime in too. Um, sorry, I'll actually look at the right camera this time. Um, that, yeah, annual uh, monitoring is incredibly important, uh, but I think we're, we're really fortunate now to live in this time of having really high quality aerial imagery, um, you know, high resolution and also a rather good uh, temporal resolution uh, imagery available. It's a, a great resource for understanding things at uh, fine scales, um, but it's not a, a substitute for being on the ground, uh, seeing the, you know, the, the up close uh, view. So it's important to both be in the field and also make use of all of the uh, remote resources as well. Great. Well, I'm gonna, oh, let me just check the Q&A. Uh, let's see, for Dave, I have a question about, do you see a potential impact of the beach nourishment on dune formation? Oh, you're on mute. Good question. Um, when we were in the field, uh, we did see what we suspected was nourishment sand coming down, um, yellow orange compared to the gray of the native sand and a much larger grain size. In terms of dunes, um, there's a really powerful uh, relationship between grain size and the ability of any given wind to transport it. So the fine sand that we thought was native uh, was moving very easily with the wind and the coarse sand was had, had a larger diameter and was likely not going to be that helpful in dune building processes. And one more for you, Dave. Uh, so folks from state parks wondering if there is any design ideas for balancing growing dunes and allowing overwash areas that are um, and that are more suitable for western snowy plover and least turn nesting. So that's asking for it all. <laughs> the golden <laughs> the golden uh, dune design. <laughs> Yeah, if if a dune isn't moving and changing, it's not a dune. So it's really the processes that are operating as well as the form of the dune that's important. And yes, absolutely. On the East Coast, the washover fans are the preferred nesting area for piping plovers. Snowy plovers love the, the sand. I, th I, th I think they're trying to tune the balance at different sites will be interesting and challenging, but I think it's a worthy goal to keep all the aspects of the coastal process operating in the dune field. Great. Well, uh, we'll have a related last mentee question that I'm going to throw up, but in the meantime, I'm going to open it up to the panelists if they have any other questions for each other. Um, and or Jeff, I need you another panelist. Errol, I'll dump you back in. Feel free to jump in. And our last question, which relates to, oops, yeah, there we go. Which relates to the question about monitoring is, uh, are you seeing that? I can see it. Okay. All right. So, what do you uh, want to see next? And then, specifically, uh, are there any predictive or real time monitoring tools that you sort of heard about today or have in your mind about that would be useful for sort of estuary and estuary mouth coastal dune area um, management? So, look forward to hearing some feedback about that question. I would add to that modeling tools. I ran out of words, <laughs> but yes, modeling, <laughs> modeling as well. <laughs> yeah, thanks for segueing that, Laura. And I think um, for any participants who want to weigh in here, um, you know, this could also be, I, I was thinking, related to what's next in terms of research, but also what's next in terms of us coming together as a science and management community. I think um, those of us at the Tijuana River National Estuarine Research Reserve see ourselves in a role of trying to bridge science to management. And back in 2019, 
when we had the first Tijuana Estuary Research Symposium. It was in our training center and in person, and we had a, a small but mighty group. Um, and now being able to kind of think about the, the the research that's evolved since that time and the extraordinary interconnectedness between um, all of the research that's happening in the San Diego region, um, across disciplines, and um, increasingly with community and, and thinking about community perspectives. It would be great to hear from any of you about what you'd like to see next in terms of research, but also application of that research within your management communities. So um, that's something I know we're curious about. And, you know, we just encourage too any of our panelists to weigh in with with um, with their perspectives on on that on that topic. I don't know, Laura and, and folks at Seagran, if you're able to um, bring some of our our other panelists into our into our room here, but that might be a great, great way to um, end our, our day with a discussion on that. Adding a few of you back in now. So I'll just start reading some of what folks are putting in. Community science, crowdsourced, some cameras, real-time monitoring, online predictive models, unmanned aerial and vessels, autonomous, bridge data platforms, pilot projects for dunes. For any of our panelists who are seeing these come in or is any of this uh, shared shared interest, something you see on the horizon? I think we heard a number, I saw a number of comments and feedback about the question that there's still a lot of questions about groundwater and saltwater intrusion. So that I think we heard some really great advances in terms of understanding some of the dynamics that are happening in terms of flows, maybe more above surface and not necessarily below surface, but that seems to be sort of the next era of research is bringing in the subsurface flow and transfer, but I'd be curious what the panelists think of that. I was gonna say something completely different. So if anybody wants to respond to that, they should before I go. All right, well, I was just gonna say that I'm uh, delighted that the community science uh, bubble there is getting bigger uh, because uh, I assume it must mean that multiple people have uh, listed that uh, keyword. Um, cause I think that's just an incredibly important piece. I didn't talk about it in my talk, but I'm a avid, uh, iNaturalist user and, uh, use it in, uh, classroom settings too for students. And it's just such a, a great way for people to engage and share what the conditions were at a, you know, particular place in a particular time. I think it'll be important in our archive moving forward. Thanks, Kelly. See I don't chat. know if Sarah wants to jump in there. I know that, well, the Los Penasquito stuff involved a lot of drone imagery, but I know that at least I saw on my end with the scripts channel that also CoSnap was also being used to track some of that. And that's a pretty new community science tool, but a number of folks in um, Adam's lab or in Adam and Sarah's lab are starting to actually put more of these CoSnap uh, locations up where people can take photos and then we can monitor beach change and things like blooms and other stuff if it's um, the right sort of advantage um, from a camera. And we have such good cameras these days on all of our phones that they're um, pretty decent resolution. Yeah, CoSnap has been really an awesome addition to the project we just did on the plume spreading. Um, and I've used community science in the past to look at like extreme events so um when we have big wave events having 
people document beach change. Um, I think that, I mean, one of the themes that I see coming out of this is like cross fertilization amongst these different um, research areas. And like, you know, just hearing from everybody today has inspired me with a bunch of questions, but also ways that we could potentially collaborate with existing data sets. So, you know, the community science one in particular, the Coast Snaps station right now only sees a small portion of the mouth at Los Pen, um, but there could be a second camera that was pointed um, more into the estuary that could see the marsh and could get at some of the questions that Kelly, for example, was looking at. Um, that I think would be really valuable. And I think similar stations could be set up um, at, at the Tijuana potentially. It's, you need that high vantage point to really get something valuable. But I think that there's a lot of great potential for community science. And I think, you know, we've been collecting, my group as well as Adam's group have been collecting these really high resolution LIDAR and visual um, imagery from drones and from trucks that are just like waiting to be analyzed um, in terms of the uh, marshes and and the and the marsh change, which you know we haven't thought about that at all. Um, and I just see so much like connection between the beach change, the dunes, the mouth of the estuary changing, how that impacts the species inland. So I think there's a lot of really exciting potential. Yeah, I, one thing I, I was LIDAR, just going to add. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm yeah. just going to say I, I love LIDAR. I'm, I'm very interested in uh, LIDAR of the marsh uh, surface. Yeah, it's pretty slick, right? Yeah, one thing I was just going to say quick, too, is that in terms of connecting the dots and seeing these connections as part of the hope in doing this sort of thing, sort of the researchers see what each other are doing and then connection, connecting with the managers and or folks that are just generally interested. I mean, one point I'd make on the specific monitoring tools and data delivery, what I think we need to make sure to do is that we're understanding the needs of the folks who need to make decisions around this. And how can we present this data and visualize it in a way that's gonna be most useful? So like for me, I'm looking, used to looking at these real-time data streams in this way or that way, but I don't know that it's immediately intuitive Okay, here's what you really, here's the key point. So that's one thing as we continue these discussions, I'd like to understand personally, is the folks that are looking at these sort of products, especially as they come online, how are they using them? What would they like to see and, and set up this, this process by which we can understand how this stuff is being used and how we can deliver it in a way that is gonna be most useful? Yeah, I think we welcome any ideas in either the mentee or the chat, or if you want to email us about that. Um, I hope to see that as the next step. I think one other piece I saw was something about uh, in here about human dimensions. And I actually, I really appreciated the fact that many of the talks today talked about the human components. So whether we're evaluating the sort of human interventions like beach nourishment and dredging, and then it's uh, ecological responses to that, um, or, you know, understanding how we, you know, our restoration efforts uh, might be, might, might be winning in some areas, or, you know, um, what techniques we're sort of seeing that might work or might not work, or, um, and also just um, some of the historic ecology or history of how our shoreline has been modified pretty significantly, but also what what might it look like in the future. So appreciate a lot of the, the human dimensions. And I think we can do a lot more in that, understanding that this is a pretty heavily used um, and culturally significant place for many peoples. Well, Laura, you... Uh... You, I, I, I don't know if it's any accident, but you picked the one that I submitted to Menti. <laughs> so you and I are on the same page about that. And it was, it was really great to hear so much of the application of the science 
informing decision making in in this region and for our coasts. And I think um, it was also really exciting to see so much interdisciplinary work being presented across the various presentations. And and for me, it would be great moving forward to think about ways in which we can elevate um, presenting. Uh, some of the really amazing social science that's been done in this area around some of the real challenges in um, accomplishing coastal management. So i um, excited to see that moving forward. I'll open it up to any other panelists who'd like to share any of their reflections on our day together. Just really appreciative of the energy and, and, uh, and stamina to make it through a multi-hour Zoom uh, symposium. Any final remarks or, or thoughts? I see some some folks still participating in Menti, but we open up the floor to any of our panelists to share their reflections. Yeah, I would just add again, sort of echo what you said at the beginning, Kristen. This started out a couple of years ago with a fairly specific objective with a few specific projects in Tijuana and Penasquitos. This one has broadened out a little bit, but I think we really would like to revisit that. There's a lot of stuff we didn't touch on today. A lot of folks doing cool work, a lot of management needs we need to address. And I would really like to think about revisiting this and, and expanding it and, and perhaps making some sort of semi-regular thing. So stay tuned as we think more about that and try and capture some of the energy um, and cool work being done around these systems. Thanks, Jeff. I love that idea. I also want to echo what Jeff said earlier about, you know, what can what can we provide to managers? I know, you know, as a researcher, we tend to operate on rather slow time scales, and that's not the time scales that managers need. And and I would love you know, more concrete feedback from the managers that are out there on like what exactly, you know, people want. Is it is it a real-time sensor on a website or is it, um, you know, a prediction of when a mouth is going to close or, yeah. So I think that that would be really helpful feedback. I see Lisa has her hand up. Lisa, please feel free. Yeah, I, I'm, um, I'm wondering whether there are quick response teams that are available to respond in the biological or chem, you know, physical chemical realm when something major happens, you know, whether it's a cliff collapsing or, uh, you know, a massive red tide event or whatever it is, you know, a lot of the things we studied happened during the pandemic and it was really hard to mobilize people. And we also had a lot of restrictions about even going in the field from the university. But I'm I'm wondering, you know, whether there's a team and a kit and a, a set of things that can allow, you know, responses that are less than one day, you know, in, in less than a day to get out, get people out there. Even if there isn't a funding award specific to that, ultimately, it can often be helpful. I know what other people think. I'll chime in because I'm not sure Adam is uh, on anymore, but when he first got on this morning, we did talk about his uh, sort of quick response work that they're doing right now, but he did say one of the big challenges that they're having is because the beaches are so eroded, some of the tools that they typically use for these response monitoring, like the LIDAR trucks and other things. Um, we can't actually access a lot of these areas because they have been degraded so significantly. So we're kind of um, stuck using the drones, but the um, but I think that I think drones appear to be something that a lot of um, I know Dave Hubbard and I are also working with a number of others at UC Santa Barbara. There's a lot of, and UCLA doing a lot of drone surveys. So those seem to be um, coupled with, you know, some satellite imagery and other things, at least being able to help us capture broader swaths of the coast and rapid response changes. Um, when, like we mentioned before, public, there's sometimes there's public health and safety concerns. Sometimes there's access challenges, but, um, but I agree trying to figure out what tools in the toolbox we do have and how that data can benefit multiple parties um, in terms of understanding change and response. 
I mean, for studying the sediment benthos, we can't put up a drone necessarily, right? We have to have people on site <laughs> taking samples. Jeff, I see your hand up. That yeah, relevant? just to just to respond to Lisa quickly. Yeah, it would it would be great to do that. And we, you know, there's challenges associated. It's, it's certainly, you know, like the real time. Let's get out there quickly with the workflow that we sort of have. We've had a, you know, sometimes it's able to use we're able to use like consulting firms or something like that, and that can have those folks on on the ready. And sometimes this has to happen like with stormwater sampling where there there's an event and you can plan ahead a little bit. It is a challenge, but something we should think about more. But I will say that during the pandemic, I mean, a lot of that information we got during that 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 harmful algal bloom was from deployed instrumentation and we were stuck in our homes. So it really became obvious to us having things like cameras and these data loggers out there, um, especially if they were telemeter and you can see what was going on in real time but even getting the the information after the fact it just really hammered home to me the value of having this just deployed instrumentation and the, the the flavors of which some of we saw today the biosensors all that sort of thing that i'm sure and you know the stuff trent talked about i'm sure there's more as well so i think that we could really be pushing on that and leaning on that as well is to get these instruments in the water and you don't know what you're always going to catch but if they're there at least you have the possibility of catching it thanks jeff trent i saw your hand up oh yeah thanks so um yeah, building on uh, Sarah and Jeff's comments, it sounds like a next uh, concrete step could be to workshop some um, possible user web interfaces to to get specific ideas on what kinds of data are and are not useful. Um, I don't know if the participants here would be interested in engaging in something like that, but that would help us in particular um, understand what kinds of, of information might be useful and in what format. Um, so, you know, I, I suppose that's sort of an uh, <laughs> an open suggestion, an invitation for a next step would be to um, develop, uh, have a few pilot demonstrations of what kind, how the data can be displayed, what kinds of data there are, and to get some um, some real specific feedback on on user interface and and, and uh, site design. So I'll just mention the two things. There were some things in the chat, I think, that went out. So there is a NERS science collaborative document about um, management and science transfer needs expressed by some of the National Estuary and Research Reserves. Um, and then Jan from SCORP said that they're also very interested in continuing to work on these ways to do, um, you know, more science specific management science. Jan, I can, I can give you, allow you to talk if you want to add something here. There we go. Uh, hey, Laura, you didn't have to, you didn't have to unmute me. I was just agreeing with what you all were saying that we're definitely interested in piloting some of those, you know, uh, more community user as well as management user interfaces between the data um, and the management side of things. Uh, and then Lisa has, if anyone wants a copy of their 2022 paper on the historical benthos response to mouth closure and hypoxia in Los Penasquitos, feel free to send her an email. Anyone else should have email? And um, <clears throat> Sam Winters brings up uh, the loss of cultural and archaeological sites to coastal erosion. Um, I think that that is definitely something that I know state parks and the National Estuary and Research Reserve are thinking about, as well as some others. Um, uh, I think Audubon is even thinking about that first Mission Bay. Uh, and we do know that some 
uh, ancestral territory of the Kumeyaay has already been lost, um, you know, is underwater and there's recognition about that, but still just trying to understand, yeah, the cultural component um, is important. Great. Thanks, Laura, for capturing all that. Um, we have just a couple minutes left, so any final thoughts uh, among panelists or among our participants, feel free to put in the chat. Um, I will myself will say very grateful for the time today um, with you all. Really appreciate all the work that um, went into thinking, conceptualizing, and, and uh, delivering this research symposium. It's been a number of years since we were able to do it, so very glad to be back together again in community between our researchers and manage managers here um, in the San Diego estuaries. So um, with that, I will point you to the chat. Uh, please let us know about your experience with the research symposium. It really does help us to have the data to be able to um, better understand how to meet your needs and create new opportunities for us to come together. So you'll see a Google form there in the chat. It's a very quick four question survey and an opportunity for some open ended um, feedback as well. If you have any reflections after you take a moment to have lunch and enjoy the rest of your afternoon. So. Um, with that, thank you so much. This was a great opportunity to be uh, together again on behalf of the Tijuana River National Estuarine Research Reserve, NOAA, Scripps Institution of Oceanography, California State Parks, California Sea Grant, and the National Estuarine Research Reserve System Science Collaborative. We um, really enjoyed spending time with you today. So look forward to our next steps and um, have a great lunch. Bye-bye. Thank you, Kristen, for moderating. Thanks, Laura, for everything and to your Sea Grant team. Thanks, Bye. everybody. You're welcome. It was awesome. Thanks to all the panelists and attendees. Thanks, Melissa. Thanks, Tanya, for all your help with the production of this event.